Chapter 6 of Henry D. Thoreau. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mark Smith. Early Essays in Authorship by Franklin Benjamin Sanborn. It has been a common delusion, not yet quite faded away, that the chief transcendentalists were but echoes of each other, that Emerson imitated Carlyle, Thoreau and Alcott imitated Emerson, and so on to the end of the chapter. No doubt that the atmosphere of each of these men affected the others, nor that they shared a common impulse communicated by what Matthew Arnold likes to call the zeitgeist, the ever-felt spirit of the time. In the most admirable of the group, who is called by preeminence the sage of Concord, the poet Emerson, there has been an outbreathing inspiration as profound as that of the zeitgeist himself, so that even Hawthorne, the least susceptible of men, found himself affected, as he says, after living for three years within the subtle influence of an intellect like Emerson's. But, in fact, Thoreau brought to his intellectual tasks an originality as marked as Emerson's, if not so brilliant and star-like, a patience far greater than his, and a proud independence that makes him the most solitary of modern thinkers. I have been struck by these qualities in reading his yet unknown first essays in authorship, the juvenile papers he wrote while in college, from the age of seventeen to that of twenty, before Emerson had published anything except his first little volume, Nature. And while Thoreau, like other young men, was reading Johnson and Goldsmith, Addison, and the earlier English classics, from Milton backwards to Chaucer. Let me therefore quote from these papers, carefully preserved by him, with their dates, and sometimes with the marks of the rhetorical professor on their margins. Along with these may be cited some of his earlier verses, in which a sentiment more purely human and almost amatory appears than in the later and colder, if higher, flights of his song. The earliest writings of Thoreau, placed in my hands by his literary executor, Mr. Harrison Blake of Worcester, are the first of his Cambridge essays, technically called Themes and Forensics. These began several years before his daily journals were kept, namely in 1834, and it is curious that one of them, dated January 17, 1835, but written in 1834, recommends keeping a private journal or record of our thoughts, feelings, studies, and daily experience. This is precisely what Thoreau did from 1837 till his death, and it may be interesting to see what reasons the boy of seventeen advanced for the practice. He says, As those pieces which the painter sketches for his own amusement in his leisure hours are often superior to his most elaborate productions, so it is that ideas often suggest themselves to us spontaneously, as it were, far surpassing in beauty those which arise in the mind upon applying ourselves to any particular subject. Hence, could a machine be invented, which would instantaneously arrange upon paper each idea as it occurs to us, without any exertion on our part, how extremely useful would it be considered? The relation between this and the practice of keeping a journal is obvious. If each one would employ a certain portion of each day in looking back upon the time which has passed, and in writing down his thoughts and feelings, in reckoning up his daily gains, that he may be able to detect whatever false coins may have crept into his coffers, and, as it were, in settling accounts with his mind. Not only would his daily experience be greatly increased, since his feelings and ideas would thus be more clearly defined, but he would be ready to turn over a new leaf, having carefully perused the preceding one, and would not continue to glance carelessly over the same page, without being able to distinguish it from a new one. This is ingenious, quaint, and mercantile bespeaking the hereditary bent of his family to trade and orderly accounts. But what follows in the same essay is more to the purpose, as striking the keynote of Thoreau's whole afterlife. He adds, Most of us are apt to neglect the study of our own characters, thoughts, and feelings, and, for the purpose of forming our own minds, look to others who should merely be considered 
as different editions of the same great work. To be sure, it would be well for us to examine the various copies that we might detect any errors, yet it would be foolish for one to borrow a work which he possessed himself, but had not perused. The earliest record of the day's observations, which I find, is dated a few months later than this, April 20th, 1835, when Henry Thoreau was not quite eighteen, and relates to the beauties of nature. The first passage describes a Sunday prospect from the garret window of his father's house, afterwards the residence of Mr. William Monroe, the benefactor of the Concord Library, on the main street of the village. He writes, "'Twas always my delight to monopolize the little Gothic window which overlooked the kitchen garden, particularly of a Sabbath afternoon, when all around was quiet and nature herself was taking her afternoon nap when the last peal of the bell in the neighbouring steeple, swinging slow with sullen roar, had left the vale to solitude and me, and the very air scarcely dared breathe, lest it should disturb the universal calm, then did I use, with eyes upturned, to gaze upon the clouds, and, allowing my imagination to wander, search for flaws in their rich drapery, that I might get a peep, at that world beyond which they seem intended to veil from our view now is my attention engaged by a truant hawk as like a messenger from those ethereal regions he issues from the bosom of a cloud and at first a mere speck in the distance comes circling onward exploring every seeming creek and rounding every jutting precipice and now his mission ended what can be more majestic than his stately flight as he wheels around some towering pine enveloped in a cloud of smaller birds that have united to expel him from their premises the second passage under the same date seems to describe earlier and repeated visits made by his elder brother john and himself to a hill which was always a favourite resort of thoreau's fairhaven cliffs overlooking the river bay known as fairhaven a mile or two up the river from concord village towards sudbury in the freshness of the dawn my brother and i were ready to enjoy a stroll to a certain cliff distant a mile or more where we were wont to climb to the highest peak and seating ourselves on some rocky platform catch the first ray of the morning sun as it gleamed upon the smooth still river wandering in sullen silence far below the approach to the precipice is by no means calculated to prepare one for the glorious denouement at hand after following for some time a delightful path that winds through the woods occasionally crossing a rippling brook and not forgetting to visit a sylvan dell whose solitude is made audible by the unwearied tinkling of a crystal spring you suddenly emerge from the trees upon a flat and mossy rock which forms the summit of a beetling crag the feelings which come over one on first beholding this freak of nature are indescribable the giddy height the iron-bound rock the boundless horizon open around and the beautiful river at your feet with its green and sloping banks fringed with trees and shrubs of every description are calculated to excite in the beholder emotions of no common occurrence to inspire him with noble and sublime emotions the eye wanders over the broad and seemingly compact surface of the slumbering forest on the opposite side of the stream and catches an occasional glimpse of a little farmhouse resting in a green hollow and lapped in the bosom of plenty while a gentle swell of the river a rustic and fortunately rather old-looking bridge on the right with the cloud-like watcher set in the distance give a finish and beauty to the landscape that is rarely to be met with even in our own fair land this interesting spot if we may believe tradition was the favourite haunt of the red man before the axe of his pale-faced visitor had laid low its loftier honours or his strong water had wasted the energies of the race here we have a touch of fine writing natural in a boy who read irving and goldsmith and exaggerating a little the dimensions of the rocks and rills of which he wrote but how smooth the flow of description how well placed the words how sure and keen the eye of the young observer 
To this mount of vision did Thoreau and his friends constantly resort in after years, and it was on the plateau beneath that Mr. Alcott, in 1843, was about to cut down the woods and build his paradise, when a less inviting fate, as he thought, beckoned his English friend Lane and himself to Fruitlands in the distant town of Harvard. At some point after this, perhaps while Thoreau was encamped at Walden with his books and his flute, Mr. Emerson sent him the following note, which gives us now a glimpse into that Arcadia. Will you not come up to the cliff this p.m. at any hour convenient to you, where our ladies will be greatly gratified to see you, and, the more they say, if you will bring your flute for the echo's sake, though now the wind blows? R.W.E. Monday, one o'clock p.m. It does not appear that Thoreau wrote verses at this time, though he was a great reader of the best poetry, of Milton very early, and with constant admiration and quotation. Thus, in a college essay of 1835 on simplicity of style, he has this passage concerning the Bible and Milton. The most sublime and noblest precepts may be conveyed in a plain and simple strain, the scriptures afford abundant proof of this. What images can be more natural, what sentiments of greater weight, and at the same time more noble and exalted than those with which they abound? They possess no local or relative ornament which may be lost in a translation. Clothed in whatever dress, they still retain their peculiar beauties. Here is simplicity itself. Everyone allows this, everyone admires it, yet how few attain to it. The union of wisdom and simplicity is plainly hinted at in the following lines of Milton. Suspicion sleeps at wisdom's gate, and to simplicity resigns her charge. Early in 1837, Thoreau wrote an elaborate paper, though of no great length, on Milton's L'Allegro and Il Penseroso, with many quotations, in course of which he said, these poems place Milton in an entirely new and extremely pleasing light to the reader, who was previously familiar with him as the author of Paradise Lost Alone. If before he venerated, he may now admire and love him. The immortal Milton seems for a space to have put on mortality, to have snatched a moment from the weightier cares of heaven and hell, to wander for a while among the sons of men. I have dwelt upon the poet's beauties, and not so much as glanced at his blemishes. A pleasing image, or a fine sentiment, loses none of its charms, though Burton, or Beaumont, and Fletcher, or Marlowe, or Sir Walter Raleigh, may have written something very similar, or even in another connection, may have used the identical word, whose aptness we so much admire. That always appeared to me a contemptible kind of criticism which deliberately and in cold blood can dissect the sublimest passage and take pleasure in the detection of slight verbal incongruities. When applied to Milton, it is little better than sacrilege. The moral view taken by the young collegian in these essays is quite as interesting as the literary opinions or the ease of his style. In September 1835, discussing punishments, he says, Certainty is more effectual than severity of punishment. No man will deliberately cut his own fingers. Some have asked, Cannot reward be substituted for punishment? Is hope a less powerful incentive to action than fear? When a political pharmacopoeia has the command of both ingredients, wherefore employ the bitter instead of the sweet? This reasoning is absurd. Does a man deserve to be rewarded for refraining from murder? Is the greatest virtue merely negative? Or does it rather consist in the performance of a thousand everyday duties hidden from the eye of the world? In an essay on the effect of storytelling, written in 1836, he says, The story of the world never ceases to interest. The child enchanted by the melodies of Mother Goose, the scholar pondering the tale of Troy Divine, and the historian breathing the atmosphere of past ages, all manifest the same passion, are alike the creatures of curiosity. The same passion for the novel, somewhat modified to be sure, 
that is manifested in our early days leads us in afterlife when the sprightliness and credulity of youth have given way to the reserve and scepticism of manhood to the more serious though scarcely less wonderful annals of the world the love of stories and of story-telling cherishes a purity of heart a frankness and candour of disposition a respect for what is generous and elevated a contempt for what is mean and dishonourable and tends to multiply merry companions and never-failing friends in march eighteen thirty seven in an essay on the source of our feelings of the sublime thoreau says the emotion excited by the sublime is the most unearthly and godlike we mortals experience it depends for the peculiar strength with which it takes hold on and occupies the mind upon a principle which lies at the foundation of that worship which we pay to the creator himself and is fear the foundation of that worship is fear the ruling principle of our religion is it not rather the mother of superstition yes that principle which prompts us to pay an involuntary homage to the infinite the incomprehensible the sublime forms the very basis of our religion it is a principle implanted in us by our maker a part of our very selves we cannot eradicate it we cannot resist it fear may be overcome death may be despised but the infinite the sublime seize upon the soul and disarm it we may overlook them or rather fall short of them we may pass them by but so sure as we meet them face to face we yield speaking of national characteristics he says it is not a little curious to observe how man the boasted lord of creation is the slave of a name a mere sound how much mischief of those magical words north south east and west caused could we rest satisfied with one mighty all-embracing west leaving the other three cardinal points to the old world methinks we should not have cause for so much apprehension about the preservation of the union this was written in february eighteen thirty seven before he had reached the age of nineteen he thus declared his independence of foreign opinion while asserting its general sway over american literature in eighteen thirty six we are as it were but colonies true we have declared our independence and gained our liberty but we have dissolved only the political bands which connected us with great britain though we have rejected her tea she still supplies us with food for the mind the aspirant to fame must breathe the atmosphere of foreign parts and learn to talk about things which the homebred student never dreamed of if he would have his talents appreciated or his opinion regarded by his countrymen ours are authors of the day they bid fair to outlive their works they are too fashionable to write for posterity true there are some amongst us who can contemplate the babbling brook without in imagination polluting its waters with a mill-wheel but even they are prone to sing of skylarks and nightingales perched on hedges to the neglect of the homely robin redbreast and the straggling rail fences of their own native land so early did he take this position from which he never varied in may eighteen thirty seven we find another note in his opening life in an essay on paley's common reasons he says man does not wantonly rend the meanest tie that binds him to his fellows he would not stand aloof even in his prejudices did not the stern demands of truth require it he is ready enough to float with the tide and when he does stem the current of popular opinion sincerity at least must nerve his arm he has not only the burden of proof but that of reproof to support we may call him a fanatic an enthusiast but these are titles of honour they signify the devotion and entire surrendering of himself to his cause so far as my experience goes man never seriously maintained an objectionable principle doctrine or theory error never had a sincere defender her disciples were never enthusiasts this is strong language i confess but i do not rashly make use of it we are told that to err is human but i would rather call it inhuman if i may use the word in this sense i speak not of those errors that have to do with facts and occurrences but rather errors of judgment 
Here we have that bold generalization and that calm love of paradox which mark his later style. The lofty imagination was always his too, as where this youth of nineteen says in the same essay, Mystery is yet afar off. It is but a cloud in the distance, whose shadow, as it flits across the landscape, gives a pleasing variety to the scene. But as the perfect day approaches, its morning light discovers the dark and straggling clouds, which at first skirted the horizon, assembling as at a signal, and, as they expand and multiply, rolling slowly onwards to the zenith, till, at last, the whole heavens, if we accept a faint glimmering in the east, are overshadowed. What a confident and flowing movement of thought is here, like the prose of Milton or Jeremy Taylor, but with a more restrained energy. Duty, writes the young moralist in another essay of 1837, is one and invariable. It requires no impossibilities, nor can it ever be disregarded with impunity so far as it exists, it is binding. And, if all duties are binding, so as on no account to be neglected, how can one bind stronger than another? None but the highest minds can attain to moral excellence. With by far the greater part of mankind, religion is a habit, or rather, habit is religion. However paradoxical it may seem, it appears to me that to reject religion is the first step towards moral excellence. At least no man ever attained to the highest degree of the latter by any other road. Could infidels live double the number of years allotted to other mortals, they would become patterns of excellence. So too of all true poets. They would neglect the beautiful for the true. I suspect that Thoreau's first poems date from the year 1836 or 37, since the Big Red Journal in which they were copied was begun in October 1837. The verses entitled To the Maiden in the East were by no means among the first which date from 1836 or earlier, but near these in time was that poem called Sympathy, which was the first of his writings to appear in Mr. Emerson's Dial. These last were addressed, we are told, to Ellen Sewell, with whom, the legend says, both Henry and John Thoreau were in love. Few of these poems show any imitation of Mr. Emerson, whose own verses at that time were mostly unpublished, though he sometimes read them in private to his friends. But like most of Thoreau's verses, these indicate a close familiarity with the Elizabethan literature and what directly followed it in the time of the Stuarts. The measure of sympathy was that of Davenant's Gondibert, which Thoreau, almost alone in his contemporaries, had read. The thought was above Davenant, and ranged with Raleigh and Spencer. These verses will not soon be forgotten. Lately, alas, I knew a gentle boy, whose features all were cast in virtue's mould, as one she had designed for beauty's toy, but after manned him for her own stronghold. Say not that Caesar was victorious, with toil and strife, who stormed the house of fame. In other sense, this youth was glorious, himself a kingdom wheresoever he came. Eternity may not the chance repeat, but I must tread my single way alone, in sad remembrance that we once did meet, and know that bliss irrevocably gone. The spheres henceforth my elegy shall sing, for elegy has other subject none. Each strain of music in my ears shall ring, knell of departure from that other one. Is it then too late the damage to repair? Distance, forsooth, from my weak grass path reft, the empty husk, and clutch the useless tear, but in my hands the wheaten kernel left. If I but love that virtue which he is, though it be scented in the morning air, Still shall we be dearest acquaintances, nor mortals know a sympathy more rare. The other poem seems to have been written later than the separation of which that one so loftily speaks, and it vibrates with a tenderer chord than sympathy. It begins, Lo, in the eastern sky is set thy glancing eye. And then it goes on with the picture of lover-like things, the thrushes and the flowers, until he says, 
the trees are welcome waved and lakes their margin laved when thy free mind to my retreat did wind then comes the persian dialect of high love it was a summer eve the air did gently heave while yet a low-hung cloud thy eastern skies did shroud the lightning's silent gleam startling my drowsy dream seemed like the flash under thy dark eyelash i'll be thy mercury thou cytherea to me distinguished by thy face the earth shall learn my place as near beneath thy light will i outwear the night with mingled ray leading the westward way let us said her face, break up the tiresome roof of heaven into new forms and with as bold a flight did this young poet pass to his stellar duties then dropping to the conquered meadow again like the tuneful lark he chose a less celestial path of gentle slope and wide as thou wert by my side i'll walk with gentle pace and choose the smoothest place and carefully dip the oar and shun the winding shore and gently steer my boat where water lilies float and cardinal flowers stand in their sylvan bowers a frivolous question has sometimes been raised whether the young thoreau knew what love was like the sicilian shepherd who found him a native of the rocks a lion's whelp with his poet nature he early gathered this experience and passed on praising afterwards the lion's nature in the universal god implacable is love foes may be bought or teased from their hostile intent but he goes unappeased who is on kindness bent there's nothing in the world i know that can escape from love for every depth it goes below and every height above the red journal of five hundred and ninety-six long pages in which the early verses occur was the first collection of thoreau's systematic diarizing it ran on from october eighteen thirty seven to june eighteen forty and was succeeded by another journal of three hundred and ninety-six pages which was finished early in eighteen forty one he wrote his first lecture on society in march eighteen thirty eight and read it before the concord lyceum in the freemasons hall april eleventh eighteen thirty eight in the december following he wrote a memorable essay on sound and silence and in february eighteen forty wrote his first printed paper of consequence as he says on aulus perseus flaccus the best of the early verses seem to have been written between eighteen thirty six and forty one his contributions to the dial which he helped edit were taken from his journals and ran through nearly every number from july eighteen forty to april eighteen forty four when that magazine ceased for these papers he received nothing but the thanks of emerson and the praise of a few readers miss elizabeth peabody in february eighteen forty three wrote to thoreau that the regular income of the dial does not pay the cost of its printing and paper yet there are readers enough to support it if they would only subscribe and they will subscribe if they are convinced that only by doing so can they secure its continuance they did not subscribe and in the spring of eighteen forty four it came to an end in eighteen forty two thoreau took a walk to wachesett his nearest mountain and the journal of this excursion was printed in the boston miscellany of eighteen forty three in it occurred the verses written at least as early as eighteen forty one in which he addresses the mountains of his horizon monadnock wachesett and the peterborough hills of new hampshire these verses were for some time in the hands of margaret fuller for publication in the dial if she saw fit but she returned them with the following characteristic letter the first addressed by her to thoreau concord eighteenth october eighteen forty one i do not find the poem on the mountains improved by mere compression though it might be by fusion and glow its merits to me are a noble recognition of nature two or three manly thoughts and in one place a plaintive music 
The image of the ships does not please me originally. It illustrates the greater by the less, and affects me as when Byron compares the light on Jura to that of the dark eye of woman. I cannot define my position here, and a large class of readers would differ from me. As the poet goes on to unhone primeval timber, for knees so stiff, for masts so limber, he seems to chase an image already rather forced into conceits. Yet, now that I have some knowledge of the man, it seems there is no objection I could make to his lines, with the exception of such offences against taste as the lines about the humours of the eye, as to which we are already agreed, which I would not make to himself. He is healthful, rare, of open eye, ready hand, and noble scope. He sets no limits to his life, nor to the invasions of nature. He is not willfully pragmatical, cautious, ascetic, or fantastical. But he is as yet a somewhat bare hill, which the warm gales of spring have not visited. Thought lies too detached. Truth is seen too much in detail. We can number and mark the substances embedded in the rock. Thus his verses are startling as much as stern. The thought does not excuse its conscious existence by letting us see its relation with life. There is a want of fluent music. Yet what could a companion do at present, unless to tame the guardian of the Alps too early, leave him at peace amid his native snows? He is friendly, he will find the generous office that shall educate him. It is not a soil for the citron and the rose, but for the whortleberry, the pine, or the heather. The unfolding of affections, a wider and deeper human experience, the harmonizing influences of other natures, will mould the man and melt his verse. He will seek thought less, and find knowledge the more. I can have no advice or criticism for a person so sincere, but if I give my impression of him, I will say, he says too constantly of nature, she is mine, she is not yours till you have been more hers. Seek the lotus, and take a draught of rapture. Say not so confidently, all places, all occasions are alike. This will never come true, till you have found it false. I do not know that I have more to say now. Perhaps these words will say nothing to you. If intercourse should continue, perhaps a bridge may be made between two minds so widely apart. For I apprehended you in spirit and you did not seem to mistake me so widely as most of your kind do. If you should find yourself inclined to write to me, as you thought you might, I dare say many thoughts would be suggested to me, many have already, by seeing you from day to day. Will you finish the poem in your own way, and send it for the dial? Leave out, and seem to milk the sky. The image is too low. Mr. Emerson thought so too. Farewell. May truth be irradiated by beauty. Let me know whether you go to the lonely hut. Author footnote number eight. The Hollowell Place, no doubt. And write to me about Shakespeare, if you read him there. I have many thoughts about him, which I have never yet been led to express. Margaret F. The penciled paper Mr. E. put into my hands, I have taken the liberty to copy it. You expressed one day my own opinion that the moment such a crisis is past, we may speak of it. There is no need of artificial delicacy, of secrecy. It keeps its own secrets. It cannot be made false. Thus you will not be sorry that I have seen the paper. Will you not send me some other records of the good week? Faithful are the wounds of a friend. This searching criticism would not offend Thoreau, nor yet the plainness with which the same tongue told the faults of a prose paper, perhaps the service, which Margaret rejected in this note. Concord, 1st of December, 1841. I am to blame for so long detaining your manuscript, but my thoughts have been so engaged that I have not found a suitable hour to re-read it as I wished till last night. This second reading only confirms my impression from the first. The essay is rich in thoughts, and I should be pained not to meet it again. But then, the thoughts seem to me so out of their natural order, that I cannot read it through without pain. I never once feel myself in a stream of thought, but seem to hear the grating of tools on the mosaic. It is true, as Mr. Emerson says, that essays not to be compared with this have found their way into the dial. 
but then these are more unassuming in their tone and have an air of quiet good breeding which induces us to permit their presence yours is so rugged that it ought to be commanding these were the years of thoreau's apprenticeship in literature and many were the tasks and mortifications he must endure before he became a master of the writer's art end of chapter 6 recording by mark smith Chapter 7 of Henry D. Thoreau. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne Spiegel. Henry D. Thoreau by Franklin Benjamin Sanborn. Chapter 7 Friends and Companions. Margaret Fuller, says William Henry Channing, was indeed the friend. This was her vocation. It was no less the vocation of Thoreau, though in a more lofty, unvarying, and serene manner. Literally, says the friend who best knew him, his views of friendship were high and noble. Those who loved him never had the least reason to regret it. He made no useless professions, never asked one of those questions that destroy all relation, but he was on the spot at the time and had so much of human life in his keeping to the last that he could spare a breathing place for a friend. He meant friendship, and meant nothing else, and stood by it without the slightest abatement, not veering as a weathercock with each shift of a friend's fortune, nor like those who bury their early friendships in order to make room for fresh corpses. It is therefore impossible to sketch him by himself. He could have said, with Ellery Channing, O band of friends, ye breathe within this space, and the rough finish of humble man, by your kind touches, raises into art. His earliest companion was his brother John, a flowing generous spirit, as one describes him, for whom his younger brother never ceased to grieve. Walking among the Cahasset rocks, and looking at the scores of shipwrecked men from the Irish brig St. John in 1849, he said, a man can attend but one funeral in his life, can behold but one corpse. With him it was the funeral of John Thoreau in February 1842. They had made the voyage of the Concord and Merrimack together in 1839. They had walked and labored together, and invented Indian names for one another from boyhood. John was Sackham Hopeful of Hopewell, a sunny soul, always serene and loving. When publishing his first book in 1849, Henry dedicated it to this brother with the simple verse, Where'er thou sailest, who sailed with me, Though now thou climbest loftier mounts, And fairer rivers dost ascend, Be thou my muse, my brother John. John Thoreau's death was singular and painful. His brother could not speak of it without physical suffering, So that when he related it to his friend Ricketson, at New Bedford, he turned pale and was forced to go to the door for air. This was the only time Mr. Ricketson ever saw him show deep emotion. His sister Sophia once said, Henry rarely spoke of dear John. It pained him too much. He sent the following verses from Staten Island in May 1843, the year after John's death, in a letter to Helen. You will see that they apply to himself. Brother, where dost thou dwell? What sun shines for thee now? Dost thou, indeed, farewell, as we wished here below? What season didst thou find? Twas winter here. Are not the fates more kind than they appear? Is thy brow clear again, as in thy youthful years? And was that ugly pain the summit of thy fears? Yet thou wast cheery still. They could not quench thy fire. Thou didst abide their will, and then retire. Where chiefly shall I look to feel thy presence near? 
along the neighboring brook may i thy voice still hear dost thou still haunt the brink of yonder river's tide and may i ever think that thou art by my side what bird wilt thou employ to bring me word of thee for it would give them joy twould give them liberty to serve their former lord with wing and minstrelsy a sadder strain mixed with their song they've slowlier built their nests since thou art gone their lively labor rests where is the finch the thrush i used to hear ah they could well abide thy dying year now they no more return i hear them not they have remained to mourn or else forgot before the death of his brother thoreau had formed the friendship with ellery channing that was in some degree to replace the daily intimacy he had enjoyed with john thoreau this man of genius and of the moods that sometimes make genius an unhappy boon was a year younger than thoreau when he came in eighteen forty three to dwell in concord with his bride a younger sister of margaret fuller they lived first in a cottage near mr emerson's thoreau being at that time an inmate of mr emerson's household afterwards in eighteen forty three mr channing removed to a hilltop some miles away then to new york in eighteen forty four to forty five then to europe for a few months and finally to a house on the main street of the village opposite the last residence of the thoreau family where henry lived from eighteen fifty till his death in eighteen sixty two in the garden of mr channing's house which lay on the river thoreau kept his boat under a group of willows and from that friendly harbor all his later voyages were made at times they talked of occupying this house together i have an old house in a garden patch says channing you have legs and arms and we both need each other's companionship these miserable cracks and crannies which have made the wall of life look thin and fungus-like will be cemented by the sweet and solid mortar of friendship they did in fact associate more closely than if they had lived in the same house at the age of thirty-seven when contemplating a removal from the neighborhood of his friend thoreau this humorous man of letters thus described himself and his taste to another friend i am a poet or of a poetical temper or mood with a very limited income both of brains and of monies this world is rather a sour world but as i am equally with you an admirer of cooper why should i not prove a sort of unnecessary addition to your neighborhood possibly i may leave concord and my aim would be to get a small place in the vicinity of a large town with some land and if possible near to some one person with whom i might in some measure fraternize come my neighbor thou hast now a new occupation the setting up of a poet and literary man one who loves old books old garrets old wines old pipes and last not least cooper we might pass the winter in comparing vaorium editions of our favorite authors and the summer in walking and horticulture this is a grand scheme of life all it requires is the house of which i spake i think one in middle life feels averse to change and especially to local change the lares and penates love to establish themselves and desire no moving but the fatal hour may come when bidding one long one last adieu to those weather-beaten penates we sally forth with don quixote once more to strike our lances into some new truth or life or man this hour did come and the removal was made for a few months or years during which the two friends met at odd intervals and in queer companionship but the sweet and solid mortar of friendship was never broken though the wall of life came to look like a ruin when in thoreau's last illness channing in deep grief said that a change had come over the dream of life and that solitude began to peer out curiously from the dells and wood roads thoreau whispered with his foot on the step of the other world says channing it is better some things should end of their earlier friendship and of channing's poetic gift so admirable yet so little appreciated by his contemporaries this mention occurs in a letter written by thoreau in march eighteen fifty six 
I was surprised to hear the other day that Channing was in X. When he was here last, in December, I think, he said, like himself, in answer to my inquiry where he lived, that he did not know the name of the place. So it has remained in a degree of obscurity to me. I am rejoiced to hear that you are getting on so bravely with him and his verses. He and I, as you know, have been old cronies, fed the same flock by the fountain, shade, and rill, together both, ere the high lawns appeared, under the opening eyelids of the morn. We drove afield, and both together heard, etc. But, oh, the heavy change, now he is gone. The Channing you have seen and described is the real Simon Pure. You have seen him. Many a good ramble may you have together. You will see in him still more, the same kind to attract and to puzzle you. How to serve him most effectually has long been a problem with his friends. Perhaps it is left for you to solve it. I suspect that the most of you, or any one can do for him, is to appreciate his genius, to buy and read, and cause others to buy and read his poems. That is the hand which he has put forth to the world. Take hold of that. Review them if you can. Perhaps take the risk of publishing something more which he may write. Your knowledge of Cooper will help you to know Channing. He will accept sympathy and aid, but he will not bear questioning, unless the aspects of the sky are particularly auspicious. He will ever be reserved and enigmatic, and you must deal with him at arm's length. I have no secrets to tell you concerning him, and do not wish to call obvious excellencies and defects by far-fetched names. Nor need I suggest how witty and poetic he is, and what an inexhaustible fund of good fellowship you will find in him. In the record of his winter visitors at Walden, Thoreau had earlier made mention of Channing, who then lived on Poncatesset Hill, two or three miles away from the Hermitage. He who came from farthest to my lodge, says Thoreau, through deepest snows and most dismal tempests, was a poet, a farmer, a hunter, a soldier, a reporter, even a philosopher may be daunted, but nothing can deter a poet, for he is actuated by pure love. Who can predict his comings and goings? His business calls him out at all hours, even when doctors sleep. We make that small house ring with boisterous mirth, and resound with the murmur of much sober talk, making amends then to Walden Vale for the long silences. At suitable intervals there were regular salutes of laughter, which might have been referred indifferently to the last uttered or the forthcoming jest. In his week, as Thoreau floats down the Concord and past the old manse, he commemorates first Hawthorne and then Channing, saying of the latter, On Poncatesset, since, with such delay, down this still stream we took our meadowy way, a poet wise hath settled whose fine ray doth faintly shine on Concord's twilight day. Like those first stars whose silver beams on high, shining more brightly as the day goes by, most travellers cannot at first descry, but eyes that want to range the evening sky. These were true and deserved compliments, but they availed little, no more than did the praises of Emerson in The Dial and of Hawthorne in his mosses, to make Channing known to the general reader. Some years after Thoreau's death, when writing to another friend, this neglected poet said, Is there no way of disabusing S. of the liking he has for the verses I used to write? You probably know he is my only patron, but that is no reason why he should be led astray. There is no other test of the value of poetry, but its popularity— my verses have never secured a single reader but S. He really believes, I think, in these so-called verses, but they are not good. They are wholly unknown and unread, and always will be. Mediocre poetry is worse than nothing, and mine is not even mediocre. I have presented S. with the last set of those little books there is, to have them bound, if he will. He can keep them as a literary curio, and in his old age amused himself with thinking, how could ever I have liked these? Yet this self-disparaging poet was he who wrote, If my bark sinks, 
tis to another sea. And he who cried to his companions, Ye heavy-hearted mariners, who sail this shore, Ye patient, ye who labor, sitting at the sweeping oar, And see afar the flashing seagulls play On the free waters and the glad bright day. Twine with his hand the spray from out of your dreariness, from your heart weariness, I speak, for I am yours on these gray shores. It is he also who has best told in prose and verse what Thoreau was in his character and his literary art. In dedicating to his friend Henry the poem called Near Home, published in 1858, Channing thus addresses him modest and mild and kind who never spurned the needing from thy door door of thy heart which is a palace gate temperate and faithful in whose word the world might trust sure to repay unvexed by care unawed by fortune's nod slave to no lord nor coward to thy peers long shalt thou live not in this feeble verse this sleeping age but in the roll of heaven and at the bar of that high court where virtue is in place there thou shalt fitly rule and read the laws of that supremer state writ jove's behest and even old saturn's chronicle works ne'er hesiod saw types of all things and portraitures of all whose golden leaves roll back the ages doors and summon up unsleeping truths by which wheels on heaven's prime. In these majestic lines, suggestive of Dante, of Shakespeare, and of Milton, yet fitting, by the force of imagination, to the simplicity and magnanimity that Thoreau had displayed, one reads the secret of that character which made the Concord recluse first declare to the world the true mission of John Brown, whose friend he had been for a few years. Of Alcott and of Hawthorne, of Margaret Fuller and Horace Greenley, he had been longer the friend, and in the year before he met Brown, he had stood face to face with Walt Whitman in Brooklyn. Mr. Alcott's testimony to Thoreau's worth and friendliness has been constant. If I were to proffer my earnest prayer to the gods for the greatest of all human privileges, he said one day, after returning from an evening spent at Walden with Thoreau, it should be for the gift of a severely candid friend. To most, the presence of such is painfully irksome. They are lovers of present reputation, and not of that exaltation of soul which friends and discourse were given to awaken and cherish in us. Intercourse of this kind I have found possible with my friends Emerson and Thoreau, and the evenings passed in their society during these winter months have realized my conception of what friendship, when great and genuine, owes to and takes from its objects. No less emphatic was Thoreau's praise of Mr. Abbott after these long winter evenings with him in the hut. One of the last of the philosophers, he writes in Walden, Connecticut gave him to the world. He peddled first her wares, and afterwards, as he declares, his brains. These he peddles still, prompting God and disgracing man, bearing for fruit his brain only, like the nut its kernel. I think he must be the man of the most faith of any alive. His words and attitudes always suppose a better state of things than other men are acquainted with, and he will be the last man to be disappointed as the ages revolve. He has no venture in the present, but though comparatively degraded now, laws unsuspected by most will take effect, and masters of families and rulers will come to him for advice. A true friend of man, almost the only friend of human progress, he is perhaps the sanest man, and has the fewest crotchets of any I chance to know, the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Of yore we had sauntered and talked, and effectually put the world behind us, for he was pledged to no institution in it, free-born, ingenuous, great looker, great expector, to converse with whom was a New England night's entertainment. Ah, such discourse we had, hermit and philosopher, and the old settler I have spoken of, we three. It expanded and racked my little house. 
nor did thoreau participate in such discourse at walden alone but frequented mr alcott's conversations at mr emerson's house in concord at hawthorne's in salem at marston watson's in plymouth at daniel ricketson's in new bedford and once or twice in boston and new york with mr alcott and alice carey thoreau visited horace greeley at chappaqua in eighteen fifty six and with mr alcott alone he called on walt whitman in brooklyn the same year between hawthorne and thoreau ellery channing was perhaps the interpreter for they had not very much in common though friendly and mutually respectful the boat in which thoreau made his voyage of eighteen thirty nine on the concord and merrimac came afterwards into hawthorne's possession and was the frequent vehicle for channing and hawthorne as they made those excursions which hawthorne has commemorated channing also has commemorated those years when hawthorne spent the happiest hours of his life in the old manse to which he had removed soon after his marriage in eighteen forty two there in the old grey house whose end we see half peeping through the golden willow's veil whose graceful twigs make foliage through the year my hawthorne dwelt a scholar of rare worth the gentlest man that kindly nature drew new england's chaucer hawthorne fitly lives his tall compacted figure ably strung to urge the indian chase or guide the way softly reclining neath the aged elm some still rock looked out upon the scene as much a part of nature as itself in july eighteen sixty writing to his sister sophia among new hampshire mountains thoreau said mr hawthorne has come home i went to meet him the other evening at mr emerson's and found that he had not altered except that he was looking pretty brown after his voyage he is as simple and childlike as ever this was upon the return of hawthorne from his long residence abroad in england portugal and italy thoreau died two years before hawthorne and they are buried within a few feet of each other in the concord cemetery their funerals having proceeded from the same parish church near by of thoreau's relations with emerson this is not the place to speak in full it was however the most important if not the most intimate of all his friendships and that out of which the others mainly grew their close acquaintance began in eighteen thirty seven in the latter part of april eighteen forty one thoreau became an intimate of mr emerson's house and remained there till in the spring of eighteen forty three he went for a few months to be the tutor of mr william emerson's sons at staten island in eighteen forty while teaching school in concord thoreau seems to have been fully admitted into that circle of which emerson alcott and margaret fuller were the leaders in may eighteen forty this circle met as it then did frequently at the house of mr emerson to converse on the inspiration of the prophet and bard the nature of poetry and the causes of sterility of poetic inspiration in our age and country mr alcott in his diary has preserved a record of this meeting and some others of the same kind it seems that on this occasion thoreau being not quite twenty-three years old mr alcott forty-one mr emerson thirty-seven and miss fuller thirty all these were present and also jones Ferry, the salem poet dr f h hedge dr c a bartol dr caleb stetson and robert bartlett of plymouth bartlett and Ferry were graduates of harvard a year before thoreau and afterwards tutors there indeed all the company except alcott were cambridge scholars for margaret fuller without entering college had breathed in the learned air of cambridge and gone beyond the students who were her companions i find no earlier record of thoreau's participation in these meetings but afterward he was often present in may eighteen thirty nine mr alcott had held one of his conversations at the house of thoreau's mother but no mention is made of henry taking part in it at a conversation in concord in eighteen forty six one april evening thoreau came in from his walden hermitage and protested with some vehemence against mr alcott's declaration that jesus stood in a more tender and intimate nearness to the heart of mankind than any character in life or literature thoreau thought he asserted this claim for the fair hebrew in exaggeration yet he could say in the week 
it is necessary not to be christian to appreciate the beauty and significance of the life of christ this earliest of his volumes like most of his writings is a record of his friendships and in it we find that high-toned paradoxical essay on love and friendship which has already been quoted to read this literally as channing says would be to accuse him of stupidity he gossips there of a high imaginary world but its tone is no higher than was the habitual feeling of thoreau towards his friends or that sentiment which he inspired in them in mr alcott's diary for march sixteenth eighteen forty seven he writes two years before the week was made public this evening i pass with thoreau at his hermitage on walden and he reads me some passages from his manuscript volume entitled a week on the concord and merrimack rivers the book is purely american fragrant with the life of new england woods and streams and could have been written nowhere else especially i am touched by his sufficiency and soundness his aboriginal vigor as if a man had once more come into nature who knew what nature meant him to do with her virgil and white of selborne and isaac walton and yankee settler all in one i came home at midnight through the woody snow paths and slept with the pleasing dream that presently the press would give me two books to be proud of emerson's poems and thoreau's week this high anticipation of the young author's career was fully shared by emerson himself who everywhere praised the genius of thoreau and when in england in eighteen forty eight listened readily to a proposition from dr chapman the publisher for a new magazine to be called the atlantic and printed at the same time in london and in boston whose chief contributors in england should be frode garth wilkinson arthur hugh clough and perhaps carlyle and in new england emerson thoreau alcott the channings theodore parker and elliot cabot the plan came to nothing but it may have been some reminiscence of it which nine years afterward gave its name to that boston magazine the atlantic monthly mr emerson's letter was dated in london april twentieth eighteen forty eight and said i find chapman very anxious to publish a journal common to old and new england as was long ago proposed frode and clo and other oxians would gladly conspire let the massachusetts quarterly give place to this and we should have two legs and bestride the sea here i know so many good-minded people that i am sure will gladly combine but what do i or what does any friend of mine in america care for a journal not enough i fear to secure an energetic work on that side i have a letter from cabot lately and do write him to-day tis certain the massachusetts quarterly review will fail unless henry thoreau and alcott and channing and newcomb the four-legged visages fly to the rescue i am sorry that alcott's editor the dumont of our bentham the baruch of our jeremiah is so slow to be born in eighteen forty six before mr emerson went abroad we find thoreau whose own hut beside walden had been built and inhabited for a year sketching a design for a lodge which mr emerson then proposed to build on the opposite shore it was to be a retreat for study and writing at the summit of a ledge with a commanding prospect over the level country towards monadnock and wachusett in the west and northwest for this lookout mr alcott added a story to thoreau's sketch but the hermitage was never built and the plan finally resulted in a rustic summer-house erected by alcott with some aid from thoreau in mr emerson's garden in eighteen forty seven to forty eight humbler friends than poets and philosophers sometimes share the companionship of these brethren of concord in february eighteen forty seven mr alcott who was then a woodman laboring on his hillside with his own axe where afterwards hawthorne wandered and mused thus notes in his diary an incident not unusual in the town our friend the fugitive who has shared now a week's hospitalities with us sawing and piling my wood feels this new trust of freedom yet unsafe here in new england and so has left us this morning for canada we supplied him with the means of journeying and bade him godspeed to a freer land his stay with us has given image and a name to the dire entity of slavery 
It was this slave, no doubt, who had lodged for a while in Thoreau's Walden hut. My own acquaintance with Thoreau did not begin with our common hostility to slavery, which afterwards brought us most clearly together, but sprang from the accident of my editing for a few weeks the Harvard Magazine, a college monthly, in 1854-55, to in which appeared a long review of Walden and The Week. In acknowledgment of this review, which was laudatory and made many quotations from his two volumes, Thoreau, whom I had never seen, called at my room in Holworthy Hall, Cambridge, in January 1855, and left there in my absence a copy of The Week, with a message implying that it was for the writer of the magazine article. It so happened that I was in the college library when Thoreau was calling on me, and when he came directly after to the library, someone present pointed him out to me as the author of Walden. I was then a senior in college, and soon to go on my winter vacation, in course of which I wrote to Thoreau from my native town as follows. Hampton Falls, New Hampshire, January 30th, 55. My dear sir, I have had it in mind to write you a letter ever since the day when you visited me, without my knowing it, at Cambridge. I saw you afterwards at the library, but refrained from introducing myself to you, in the hope that I should see you later in the day. But as I did not, will you allow me to seek you out, when next I come to Concord? The author of the criticism in the Harvard Magazine is Mr. Morton of Plymouth, a friend and pupil of your friend, Marston Watson, of that old town. Accordingly, I gave him the book which you left with me, judging that it belonged to him. He received it with delight, as a gift of value in itself, and the more valuable for the sake of the giver. We who at Cambridge look toward Concord as a sort of mecca for our pilgrimages are glad to see that your last book finds such favor with the public. It has made its way where your name has rarely been heard before, and the inquiry, who is Mr. Thoreau, proves that the book has in part done its work. For my own part, I thank you for the new light it shows me, the aspects of nature in, and for the marvelous beauty of your descriptions. At the same time, if anyone should ask me what I think of your philosophy, I should be apt to answer that it is not worth a straw. Whenever again you visit Cambridge, be assured, sir, it would give me much pleasure to see you at my room. There or in Concord, I hope soon to see you, if I may intrude so much on your time. Believe me always, yours very truly, F. B. Sanborn. This note, which I had entirely forgotten, and of which I trust my friend soon forgave the pertness, came to me recently among his papers. With one exception, it is the only letter that passed between us, I think, in an acquaintance of more than seven years. Some six weeks after its date, I went to live in Concord, and happened to take rooms in Mr. Channing's house, just across the way from Thoreau's. I met him more than once in March 1855, but he did not call on my sister and me until the 11th of April, when I made the following brief note of his appearance. Tonight we had a call from Mr. Thoreau, who came at eight and stayed till ten. He talked about Latin and Greek, which he thought ought to be studied, and about other things. In his tones and gestures he seems to me to imitate Emerson, so that it was annoying to listen to him, though he said many good things. He looks like Emerson, too, coarser, but with something of that serenity and sagacity which E. has. Thoreau looks eminently sagacious, like a sort of wise, wild beast. He dresses plainly, wears a beard in his throat, and has a brown complexion. A month or two later, my diary expanded this sketch a little with other particulars. He is a little undersized, with a huge Emersonian nose, bluish-gray eyes, brown hair, and a ruddy, weather-beaten face, which reminds me of some shrewd and honest animals, some retired philosophical woodchuck, or magnanimous fox. He dresses very plainly, wears his collar turned over like Mr. Emerson, we young collegians then wearing ours upright, and often an old dress coat, broad in the skirts and by no means a fit. He walks about with a brisk, rustic air and never seems tired. Notwithstanding the slow admiration that these trivial comments indicated, our friendship grew apace, 
and for two years or more I dined with him almost daily, and often joined in his walks and river voyages, or swam with him in some of our numerous Concord waters. In 1857 I introduced John Brown to him, then a guest at my house, and in 1859, the evening before Brown's last birthday, we listened together to the old captain's last speech in the Concord Town Hall. The events of that year and the next brought us closely together, and I found him the staunchest of friends. This chapter might easily be extended into a volume, so long was the list of his companions and so intimate and perfect his relations with them, at least on his own side. A truth speaker he, said Emerson at his funeral, capable of the most deep and strict conversation, a physician to the wounds of any soul, a friend, knowing not only the secret of friendship, but also worshipped by those few persons who resorted to him as their confessor and prophet, and knew the deep value of his mind and great heart. His soul was made for the noblest society. He had, in a short life, exhausted the capabilities of this world. Wherever there is knowledge, wherever there is virtue, wherever there is beauty, he will find a home. End of chapter 7《Chapter 8 of Henry D. Thoreau. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Henry D. Thoreau by Benjamin Franklin Sanborn. Chapter 8 The Walden Hermitage. It is by his two years' encampment on the shore of a small lake in the Walden Woods, a mile south of Concord Village, that Thoreau is best known to the world and the book which relates how he lived and what he saw there is still as it always was the most popular of his writings like all his books it contains much that might as well have been written on any other subject but it also describes charmingly the scenes and events of his sylvan life his days and nights with nature he spent two years and a half in this retreat though often coming forth from it the localities of concord which thoreau immortalized were chiefly those in the neighborhood of some lake or stream though it would be hard to find in that well-watered town especially in springtime any place which is not neighbor either to the nine times circling river muscatiquid to the swifter asabit that like an arrow clear through troy rennest eye downward to the sea to walden or white pond to bateman's pond to the mill brook the sanguinetto the nut meadow or the second division brook all these waters and more are renowned again and again in thoreau's books like icarus the ancient high flyer he tried his fortune upon many a river fjord streamlet and broad sea where still the shore his brave attempt resounds he gave beauty and dignity to obscure places by his mention of them and it is curious that the neighbourhood of walden now the most romantic and poetical region of concord associated in every mind with this tender lover of nature and his worship of her was anciently a place of dark repute the home of pariahs and lawless characters such as fringed the sober garment of many a new england village in puritanic times close by walden is brister's hill where in the early days of emancipation in massachusetts the newly freed slaves of concord magnates took up their abode the wrathful kings on cairns apart as ossian says here dwelt cato ingram freedman of squire duncan ingram who when yet a slave in his master's back yard on the day of concord fight was brought to a halt by the fierce major pitcairn then something the worse for squire ingram's wine in order to lay down his arms and disperse as the rebels at lexington had been six hours earlier here also abode zilpha a black circe who spun linen and made the walden woods resound with her shrill singing dives in accessos ubi solus filia lucos assiduo resonat cantu testisque superbus urit odoratum nocturna in lumina cedrum argutae tenues percurrens pectin telas 
but some paroled english prisoners in the war of eighteen twelve burnt down her proud abode with its imprisoned cat and dog and hens while zilpha was absent down the road towards the village from cato's farm and zilpha's musical loom and wheel lived brister freeman who gave his name to the hill scipio brister a handy negro once the slave of squire cummings but long since emancipated and in thoreau's boyhood set free again by death and buried in an old lincoln graveyard near the ancestor of president garfield but still nearer the unmarked graves of british grenadiers who fell in the retreat from concord with this scipio africanus brister libertinus in the edge of the walden woods dwelt fenda his hospitable wife who told fortunes yet pleasantly large round and black such a dusky orb as never rose on concord before or since says thoreau such was the african colony on the south side of concord village among the woods while on the northern edge of the village along the great meadows there dwelt another colony headed by caesar robbins whose descendants still flit about the town older than all was the illustrious guinea negro john jack once a slave on the farm which is now the glebe of the old manse but who purchased his freedom about the time the old manse was built in seventeen sixty five to sixty six he survives in his quaint epitaph written by daniel bliss the young tory brother of the first mistress of the manse mrs william emerson grandmother of emerson the poet god wills us free man wills us slaves i will as god wills god's will be done here lies the body of john jack a native of africa who died march seventeen seventy three aged about sixty years though born in a land of slavery he was born free though he lived in a land of liberty he lived a slave till by his honest though stolen labours he acquired the source of slavery which gave him his freedom though not long before death the grand tyrant gave him his final emancipation and put him on a footing with kings though a slave to vice he practised those virtues without which kings are but slaves this epitaph and the anecdote already given concerning caesar robbins may illustrate the humanity and humour with which the freedmen of concord were regarded while an adventure of scipio brister's in his early days of freedom may show the mixture of savage fun and contempt that also followed them and which some of their conduct may have deserved the village drover and butcher once had a ferocious bull to kill and when he had succeeded with some difficulty in driving him into his slaughter-house on the walden road nobody was willing to go in and kill him just then brister freeman from his hill near walden came along the road and was slyly invited by the butcher to go into the slaughter-house for an axe being told that when he brought it he should have a job to do the unsuspecting freedman opened the door and walked in it was shut behind him and he found the bull drawn up in a line of battle before him after some pursuit and retreat in the narrow arena brister spied the axe he wanted and began attacking his pursuer giving him a blow here or there as he had opportunity his employers outside watched the bull fight through a hole in the building and cheered on the matador with shouts and laughter at length by a fortunate stroke the african conquered the bull fell and his slayer threw down the axe and rushed forth unhurt but his tormentors declared he was no longer the dim sombre negro he went in but literally white with terror and what was once his wool straightened out and standing erect on his head without waiting to be identified or to receive pay for his work brister affrighted and wrathful withdrew to the wooded hill and to the companionship of his fortune-telling fenda who had not foreseen the hazard of her spouse it was along the same road and down this hill passing by the town poor farm and poor house the last retreat of these straggling soldiers of fortune that thoreau went toward the village jail from his hermitage that day in eighteen forty six when the town constable carried him off from the shoemakers to whose shop he had gone to get a cobbled shoe his roommate in jail for the single night he slept there was introduced to him by the jail of mr staples a real name as a first-rate fellow and a clever man and on being asked by thoreau why he was in prison replied why they accuse me of burning a barn but i never did it as near as thoreau could make out he had gone to bed in a barn when drunk and smoked his pipe there such were the former denizens of the walden woods 
votaries of bacchus and apollo and extremely liable to take fire upon small occasion like giordano bruno's sonneteer who addressing the arabian phoenix says tu bruci nund et io in ogni loco io da cupido hai tu da febo il foco it seems by the letter of margaret fuller in eighteen forty one cited in chapter six that thoreau had for years meditated a withdrawal to a solitary life the retreat he then had in view was doubtless the hollowell farm a place as he says of complete retirement being about two miles from the village half a mile from the nearest neighbour and separated from the highway by a broad field the house stood apart from the road to nine acre corner fronting the muscataquid on a green hillside and was first seen by thoreau as a boy in his earliest voyages up the river to fairhaven bay concealed behind a dense grove of red maples through which i heard the house-dog bark this place thoreau once bought but released it to the owner whose wife refused to sign the deed of sale in his walden venture he was a squatter using for his house-lot a woodland of mr emerson's who for the sake of his walks and his wood-fire had bought land on both sides of walden pond how early thoreau formed his plan of retiring to a hut among these woods i have not learned but in a letter written to him march five eighteen forty five by his friend channing a passage occurs concerning it and it was in the latter part of the same month that thoreau borrowed mr alcott's axe and went across the fields to cut the timber for his cabin channing writes i see nothing for you in this earth but that field which i once christened briars go out upon that build yourself a hut and there begin the grand process of devouring yourself alive i see no alternative no other hope for you eat yourself up you will eat nobody else nor anything else concord is just as good a place as any other there are indeed more people in the streets of that village than in the streets of this he was writing from the tribune office in new york this is a singularly muddy town muddy solitary and silent i saw twofold drunk a few days since he said a few words to me about you says he that fellow thoreau might be something if he would only take a journey through the everlasting no thence for the north pole by g said the old clothes bag warming up i should like to take that fellow out into the everlasting no and explode him like a bombshell he would make a loud report it would be fun to see him pick himself up he needs the bloomin flower business that would be his salvation he is too dry too composed too chalky too concrete does that execrable compound of sawdust and stagnation l still prose about nothing and that nutmeg greater of a z yet shriek about nothing does anybody still think of coming to concord to live i mean new people if they do let them beware of you philosophers of course this imaginary twofold drock like carlyle's was the satirical man in the writer himself suggesting the humorous and contradictory side of things and glancing at the coolness of thoreau which his friends sometimes found provoking in his own person channing adds i should be pleased to hear from kamchatka occasionally my last devices from the polar bear are getting stale in addition to this i find that my corresponding members at van diemen's land have wandered into limbo i hear occasionally from the world everything seems to be promising in that quarter business is flourishing and the people are in good spirits i feel convinced that the earth has less claims to our regard than formerly these mild winters deserve severe censure but i am well aware that the earth will talk about the necessity of routine taxes etc on the whole it is best not to complain without necessity it is well to read this shrewd humour uttered in the opposite sense from thoreau's paradoxical wit in his walden as an introduction or motto to that book for thoreau has been falsely judged from the wit and the paradox of walden as if he were a hater of men or foolishly desired all mankind to retire to the woods as channing said soon after his friend's death the fact that our author lived for a while alone in a shanty near a pond and named one of his books after the place where it stood has led some to say he was a barbarian or a misanthrope it was a writing case 
here in this wooden inkstand he wrote a good part of his famous walden and this solitary woodland pool was more to his muse than all oceans of the planet by the force of imagination some have fancied because he moved to walden he left his family he bivouacked there and really lived at home where he went every day this last is not literally true for he was sometimes secluded in his hut for days together but he remained as social at walden as he had been while an inmate of mr emerson's family in eighteen forty one to forty three or again in eighteen forty seven to forty eight after giving up his hermitage he in fact as he says himself went to the woods because he wished to live deliberately to front only the essential facts of life and see if he could not learn what it had to teach and not when he came to die discover that he had not lived in another place he says he went to walden to transact some private business and this he did to good purpose he edited there his week some portions of which had appeared in the dial from eighteen forty to eighteen forty four but which was not published as a volume until eighteen forty nine although he had made many attempts to issue it earlier it was at walden also that he wrote his essay on carlyle which was first published in graham's magazine at philadelphia in eighteen forty seven through the good offices of horace greeley of which we shall hear more in the next chapter thoreau's hermit life was not then merely a protest against the luxury and the restraints of society nor yet an austere discipline such as monks and saints have imposed upon themselves for their souls good my purpose in going to walden was not to live cheaply nor to live dearly there but to transact some private business with the fewest obstacles he lived a life of labour and study in his hut emerson says as soon as he had exhausted the advantages of that solitude he abandoned it he had edited his first book there had satisfied himself that he was fit to be an author and had passed his first examinations then he graduated from that gymnasium as another young student might from the medical college or the polytechnic school i left the woods for as good a reason as i went there his abandoned hut was then taken by a scotch gardener hugh whelan by name who moved it some rods away to the midst of thoreau's bean-field and made it his cottage for a few years then it was bought by a farmer who put it on wheels and carried it three miles northward toward the entry of the esterbrook farm on the old carlisle road where it stood till after thoreau's death a shelter for corn and beans and a favourite haunt of squirrels and blue jays the woodcut representing the hermitage in the first edition of walden is from a sketch made by sophia thoreau and is more exact than that given in page's life of thoreau but in neither picture are the trees accurately drawn on the spot where thoreau lived at walden there is now a cairn of stones yearly visited by hundreds and growing in height as each friend of his muse adds a stone from the shore of the fair water he loves so well beat with thy paddle on the boat midway the lake the wood repeats the ordered blow the echoing note is ended in thy ear yet it retreats conceal time's possibilities and in this man the nature lies of woods so green and lakes so sheen and hermages to edge between and i may tell you that the man was good never did his neighbour harm sweet was it where he stood sunny and warm like the seat beneath a pine that winter suns have cleared away with their yellow tine red cushioned and tasselled with the day the events and thoughts of thoreau's life at walden may be read in his book of that name as a protest against society that life was ineffectual as the communities at book farm and fruitlands had proved to be and as the fouriite phalasteries in which horace greeley interested himself were destined to be in one sense all these were failures but in thoreau's case the failure was slight the discipline and experience gained were invaluable he never regretted it and the walden episode in his career has made him better known than anything else end of chapter eight chapter nine of henry d thoreau this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by jesse zuba henry d thoreau by franklin benjamin sanborn chapter nine horace in the role of mycenas in a letter to his sister sophia july twenty first eighteen forty three 
written from Mr. William Emerson's house at Staten Island, Thoreau says, In New York I have seen, since I wrote last, Horace Greeley, editor of the Tribune, who is cheerfully in earnest at his office of all work, a hearty New Hampshire boy as one would wish to meet, and says, Now be neighborly. He believes only, or mainly, first in the Sylvania Association, somewhere in Pennsylvania, and secondly, and most of all, in a new association to go into operation soon in New Jersey, with which he is connected. This was the phalanstery at which W. H. Channing afterward preached. A fortnight later, Thoreau writes to Mr. Emerson, I have had a pleasant talk with W. H. Channing, and Greeley, too. It was refreshing to meet. They were both much pleased with your criticism on Carlyle, but thought that you had overlooked what chiefly concerned them in the book, its practical aims and merits. This refers to the notice of Carlyle's Past and Present in the Dial for July 1843, and shows that Mr. Greeley was a quick reader of that magazine, as Thoreau always was of the New York Tribune. From this time onward a warm friendship continued between Thoreau and Greeley, and many letters went to and fro which reveal the able editor in the light of a modern Mycenas to the author of the Musketicid Georgics. No letters seem to have passed between them earlier than 1846, and in 1844-45 Thoreau must have known the Tribune editor best through his newspaper, and from the letters of Margaret Fuller, Ellery Channing, and other common friends, who saw much of him then, admired and laughed at him, or did both by turns. Miss Fuller, who had gone to New York to write for the Tribune, and to live in its editor's family, wrote, Mr. Greeley is a man of genuine excellence honorable, benevolent, and of an uncorrupted disposition. He is sagacious and, in his way, of even great abilities. In modes of life and manners he is a man of the people, and of the American people. With the exception of my own mother, I think him the most disinterestedly generous person I have ever known. There was a laughable side even to these fine traits, and there were eccentricities of dress and manner which others saw more keenly than this generous woman. Ellery Channing, whose eye no whimsical or beautiful object ever escaped, in the letter of March, 1845, already cited, thus signaled to Thoreau the latest news of his friend. Mumbo Jumbo is recovering from an attack of sore eyes, and will soon be out in a pair of canvas trousers, scarlet jacket, and cocked hat. I understand he intends to demolish all the remaining species of fetishism at a meal. I think it is probable it will vomit him. Thoreau wrote an essay on Carlyle in 1846, and in the summer of that year sent it to Mr. Greeley with a request that he would find a place for it in some magazine. To this request, which Mr. Greeley himself had invited, no doubt, he thus replied, August 16th, 1846. My dear Thoreau, believe me when I say that I mean to do the errand you have asked of me, and that soon, but I am not sanguine of success and have hardly a hope that it will be immediate, if ever. I hardly know a work that would publish your article all at once, and, to be continued, are words shunned like a pestilence. But I know you have written a good thing about Carlyle, too solidly good, I feel, to be profitable to yourself, or attractive to publishers. Didst thou ever, O oh my friend, ponder on the significance and cogency of the assurance, ye cannot serve God and mammon? as applicable to literature, applicable indeed to all things whatsoever? God grant us grace to endeavor to serve him rather than mammon. That ought to suffice us. In my poor judgment, if anything is calculated to make a scoundrel of an honest man, writing to sell is that very particular thing. Yours heartily, Horace Greeley. Remind Ralph Waldo Emerson and wife of my existence and grateful remembrance. On the 30th of September, Mr. Greeley again wrote, saying, I learned today through Mr. Griswold, former editor of Graham's magazine, that your lecture is accepted to appear in that magazine. Of course it is to be paid for at the usual rate, as I expressly so stated when I enclosed it to Graham. He has not written me a word on the subject, which induces me to think he may have written you. Please write me if you would have me speak further on the subject. The pay, however, is sure though the amount may not be large, and I think you may wait until the article appears before making further stipulations on the subject. 
from the tenor of this i infer that thoreau had written to say that he might wish to read his thomas carlyle as a lecture and desired to stipulate for that before it was printed he might be excused for some solicitude concerning payment from his recent experience with the publishers of the boston miscellany which had printed in eighteen forty three his walk to wachusett at the very time when thoreau in new york was making greeley's acquaintance mr emerson in boston was dunning the miscellaneous publishers and wrote to thoreau july twentieth eighteen forty three when i called on blank their partner in their absence informed me that they could not pay you at present any part of their debt on account of the boston miscellany after much talking all the promise he could offer was that within a year it would probably be paid a probability which certainly looks very slender the very worst thing he said was the proposition that you should take your payment in the form of boston miscellanies I shall not fail to refresh their memory at intervals. But I cannot learn that anything came of it. Mr. Greeley, as we shall see, was a more successful collector. On the 26th of October, 1846, he continued the adventures of the wandering essay as follows. My friend Thoreau, I know you think it odd that you have not heard further, and perhaps blame my negligence or engrossing cares. But, if so, without good reason. I have to-day received a letter from Griswold in Philadelphia, who says, The article by Thoreau on Carlyle is in type, and will be paid for liberally. Liberally is quoted as an expression of Graham's. I know well the difference between a publisher's and an author's idea of what is liberally, but I give you the best I can get as the result of three letters to Philadelphia on this subject. Success to you, my friend. Remind Mr. and Mrs. Emerson of my existence and my lively remembrance of their various kindnesses. Yours, very busy in our political contest, Horace Greeley. It would seem that Griswold, who was Rufus W. Griswold, the biographer of Poe, and Graham, who was George R. Graham, the magazine publisher of Philadelphia, did not move so fast either in publication or in payment as they had led Mr. Greeley to expect and also that Thoreau became impatient and wrote to his friend that he would withdraw the essay. Whereupon Mr. Greeley, under date of February 5, 1847, wrote thus, My dear Thoreau, although your letter only came to hand today, I attended to its subject yesterday, when I was in Philadelphia, on my way home from Washington. Your article is this moment in type, and will appear about the twentieth installment, as the leading article in Graham's magazine for next month. Now don't object to this, nor be unreasonably sensitive at the delay. It is immensely more important to you that the article should appear thus, that is, if you have any literary aspirations, than it is that you should make a few dollars by issuing it in some other way. As to lecturing, you have been at perfect liberty to deliver it as a lecture a hundred times if you had chosen. The more the better. It is really a good thing and I will see that Graham pays you fairly for it. But its appearance there is worth far more to you than money. I know there has been too much delay, and have done my best to obviate it, but I could not. A magazine that pays, and which it is desirable to be known as a contributor to, is always crowded with articles, and has to postpone some for others of even less merit. I do this myself, with good things that I am not required to pay for. Thoreau, do not think hard of Graham. Do not try to stop the publication of your article. It is best as it is. But just sit down and write a like article about Emerson, which I will give you twenty-five dollars for, if you cannot do better with it. Then one about Hawthorne at your leisure, etc., etc. I will pay you the money for each of these articles on delivery, publish them when and how I please, leaving to you the copyright expressly. In a year or two, if you will take care not to write faster than you think, you will have the material of a volume worth publishing, and then we will see what can be done. There is a text somewhere in St. Paul, my scriptural reading is getting rusty, which says, Look not back to the things which are behind, but rather to those which are before, etc. Commending this to your thoughtful appreciation, I am yours, etc. Horace Greeley. The Carlyle essay did appear in two numbers of Graham's magazine. March and April, 1847, but alas, no payment came to hand. 
After waiting a year longer, Thoreau wrote to Greeley again, March 31, 1848, informing him of the delinquency of Griswold and Graham. At once his friend replied, April 3rd, It saddens and surprises me to know that your article was not paid for by Graham, and since my honor is involved in the matter, I will see that you are paid, and that at no distant day. Accordingly, on the 17th of May, 1848, he writes again as follows. My dear friend Thoreau, I trust you have not thought me neglectful or dilatory with regard to your business. I have done my very best throughout, and it is only today that I have been able to lay my hand on the money due you from Graham. I have been to see him in Philadelphia, but did not catch him in his business office. Then I have been here to meet him, and been referred to his brother, etc. I finally found the two numbers of the work in which your article was published. Not easy, I assure you, for he has them not, nor his brother, and I hunted them up, and bought one of them at a very out-of-the-way place. And with these I made out a regular bill for the contribution, drew a draft on G. R. Graham for the amount, gave it to his brother here for collection, and to-day received the money. Now you see how to get pay yourself another time. I have pioneered the way, and you can follow it easily yourself. There has been no intentional injustice on Graham's part, but he is overwhelmed with business, has too many irons in the fire, and we did not go at him the right way. Had you drawn a draft on him at first and given it to the Concord Bank to send in for collection, you would have received your money long since. Enough of this. I have made Graham pay you seventy-five dollars, but I only send you fifty dollars, for, having got so much for Carlyle, I am ashamed to take your main woods for twenty-five dollars. This last allusion is to a new phase of the queer patronage which the good Mycenas extended to our Concord poet. In his letter of March 31st, 1848, Thoreau had offered Greeley, in compliance with his suggestion of the previous year, a paper on Katahdin and the Maine Woods, which afterwards appeared in the Union magazine. On the 17th of April, Greeley writes, I enclose you $25 for your article on Maine scenery, as promised. I know it is worth more, though I have not yet found time to read it, but I have tried once to sell it without success. It is rather long for my columns, and too fine for the million, but I consider it a cheap bargain, and shall print it myself, if I do not dispose of it to better advantage. You will not, of course, consider yourself under any sort of obligation to me, for my offer was in the way of business, and I have got more than the worth of my money. On the 17th of May, he adds, I have expectations of procuring it a place in a new magazine of high character that will pay. I don't expect to get as much for it as for Carlyle, but I hope to get fifty dollars. If you are satisfied to take the twenty-five dollars for your main woods, say so, and I will send on the money. But I don't want to seem a Jew, buying your articles at half price to speculate upon. If you choose to let it go that way, it shall be so. But I would sooner do my best for you, and send you the money. On the 28th of October, 1848, he writes, I break a silence of some duration to inform you that I hope on Monday to receive payment for your glorious account of Katahdin and the Maine Woods, which I bought of you at a Jew's bargain and sold to the Union Magazine. I am to get seventy-five dollars for it, and, as I don't choose to exploit you at such a rate, I shall insist on enclosing you twenty-five dollars more in this letter, which will still leave me twenty-five dollars to pay various charges and labors I have incurred in selling your articles and getting paid for them, the latter by far the more difficult portion of the business. In the letter of April 17, 1848, Mr. Greeley had further said, If you will write me two or three articles in the course of the summer, I think I can dispose of them for your benefit, but write not more than half as long as your article just sent me, for that is too long for the magazines. If that were in two, it would be far more valuable. What about your book, The Week? Is anything going on about it now? Why did not Emerson try it in England? I think the Howitts could get it favorably before the British public. If you can suggest any way wherein I can put it forward, do not hesitate, but command me. In the letter of May 17th, he reiterates the advice to be brief. Thoreau, if you will only write one or two articles when in the spirit— about half the length of this, 
I can sell it readily and advantageously. The length of your papers is the only impediment to their appreciation by the magazines. Give me one or two shorter, and I will try to coin them speedily. May 25th he returns to the charge, when sending the last twenty-five dollars for the main woods. Write me something shorter when the spirit moves. Never write a line otherwise, for the hack writer is a slavish beast, I know, and I will sell it for you soon. I want one shorter article from your pen that will be quoted, as these long articles cannot be, and let the public know something of your way of thinking and seeing. It will do good. What do you think of following out your thought in an essay on The Literary Life? You need not make a personal allusion, but I know you can write an article worth reading on that theme when you are in the vein. After a six months interval, November 19, 1848, Greeley resumes in a similar strain, Friend Thoreau, yours of the 17th received. Say we are even on money counts and let the matter drop. I have tried to serve you, and have been fully paid for my own disbursements and trouble in the premises, so we will move on. I think you will do well to send me some passages from one or both of your new works to dispose of to the magazines. This will be the best kind of advertisement, whether for a publisher or for readers. You may write with an angel's pen, yet your writings have no mercantile money value till you are known and talked of as an author. Mr. Emerson would have been twice as much known and read if he had written for the magazines a little, just to let common people know of his existence. I believe a chapter from one of your books printed in Graham, or The Union, will add many to the readers of the volume when issued. Here is the reason why British books sell so much better among us than American, because they are thoroughly advertised through the British reviews, magazines, and journals which circulate or are copied among us. However, do as you please. If you choose to send me one of your manuscripts, I will get it published, but I cannot promise you any considerable recompense. And, indeed, if Monroe will do it, that will be better. Your writings are in advance of the general mind here. Boston is nearer their standard. I never saw the verses you speak of. Won't you send them again? I have been buried up in politics for the last six weeks. Kind regards to Emerson. It is doubtful about my seeing you this season. Here the letters ceased for a time. Monroe did it. That is, a Boston bookseller published Thoreau's Week, which was favorably reviewed by George Ripley in the Tribune, by Lowell in the Massachusetts Quarterly, and by others elsewhere. But the book did not sell, and involved its author in debt for its printing. To meet this he took up surveying as a business, and after a time when some payment must be made, he asked his friend Greeley for a loan. In the interval, Margaret Fuller had written from Europe those remarkable letters for the Tribune, had married in Italy, sailed for home in 1850, and died on the shore of Fire Island, near New York, whither Thoreau went with her friends to learn her fate and recover the loved remains. This was in July 1850, and he no doubt saw Mr. Greeley there. A year and a half later, when he was seeking opportunities to lecture, he wrote to Mr. Greeley again in February 1852, offering himself to lecture in a course at New York, which the Tribune editor had some interest in. The reply was this. New York, February 24th, 1852. My friend Thoreau, thank you for your remembrance, though the motto you suggest is impracticable. The people's course is full for the season, and even if it were not, your name would probably not pass, because it is not merely necessary that each lecturer should continue well the course but that he shall be known as the very man beforehand. Whatever draws less than fifteen hundred hearers damages the finances of the movement, so low is the admission, and so large the expense. But, Thoreau, you are a better speaker than many, but a far better writer still. Do you wish to swap any of your wood notes wild for dollars? If yea, and you will send me some articles, shorter, if you please, than the former, I will try to coin them for you. Is it a bargain? Yours, Horace Greeley. Thoreau responded at once with some manuscripts, March 5th, and was thus addressed March 18th by his friend. I shall get you some money for the articles you sent me, though not immediately. As to your long account of a Canadian tour, I don't know. It looks unmanageable. Can't you cut it into three or four and omit all that relates to time? The cities are described to death. 
but I know you are at home with nature, and that she rarely and slowly changes. Break this up, if you can, and I will try to have it swallowed and digested. A week later he sent a letter from the publisher, Sartain, accepting the articles for a low price, and adds, If you break up your excursion to Canada into three or four articles, I have no doubt I could get it published on similar terms. April 3, 1852, he returns to a former proposition, that Thoreau shall write about Emerson, as he did six years before, on Carlyle. Friend Thoreau, I wish you to write me an article on Ralph Waldo Emerson, his works and ways, extending to one hundred pages or so, of letter-sheet like this, to take the form of a review of his writings, but to give some idea of the poet, the genius, the man, with some idea of the New England scenery and home influence, which have combined to make him what he is. Let it be calm, searching, and impartial, nothing like adulation, but a just summing up of what he is and what he has done. I mean to get this into the Westminster Review, but if not acceptable there, I will publish it elsewhere. I will pay you fifty dollars for the article when delivered, in advance if you desire it. Say the word, and I will send the money at once. It is perfectly convenient to do so. Your Carlyle article is my model, but you can give us Emerson better than you did Carlyle. I presume he would allow you to write extracts for this purpose from his lectures not yet published. I would delay the publication of the article to suit his publishing arrangements, should that be requested. Yours, Horace Greeley. To this request, as before, there came a prompt negative, although Thoreau was then sadly in need of money. Mr. Greeley wrote, April 20th, I am rather sorry you will not do the works and ways, but glad that you are able to employ your time to better purpose. But your Quebec notes haven't reached me yet, and I fear the good time is passing. They ought to have appeared in the June number of the monthlies, but now cannot before July. If you choose to send them to me all in a lump, I will try to get them printed in that way. I don't care about them if you choose to reserve or to print them elsewhere, but I can better make a use for them at this season than at any other. They were sent and offered to the Whig Review and to other magazines. But on the 25th of June, Mr. Greeley writes, I have had only bad luck with your manuscript. Two magazines have refused it on the ground of its length, saying that articles to be continued are always unpopular, however good. I will try again. It seems that the author had relied upon money from this source, and a week or two later he asks his friend to lend him the expected seventy-five dollars, offering security with mercantile scrupulosity. Promptly came this answer. New York, July 8, 1852. Dear Thoreau, yours received. I was absent yesterday. I can lend you the seventy-five dollars, and am very glad to do it. Don't talk about security. I am sorry about your manuscript, which I do not quite despair of using to your advantage. Yours, Horace Greeley. The Yankee in Canada, as it is now called, the record of Thoreau's journey through French Canada in September 1850 with Ellery Channing, was offered to Putnam's Magazine by Mr. Greeley, and begun there, but ill luck attended it. Before it went the paper on Cape Cod, which became the subject of controversy, first as to price, and then as to its tone towards the people of that region. This will explain the letters of Mr. Greeley that follow. New York, November 23, 1852. My dear Thoreau, I have made no bargain, none whatever, with Putnam concerning your manuscript. I have indicated no price to them. I handed over the manuscript because I wished it published, and presumed that was in accordance both with your interest and your wishes. And I now say to you, that if he will pay you three dollars per printed page, I think that will be very well. I have promised to write something for him myself, and shall be well satisfied with that price. Your Canada is not so fresh and acceptable as if it had just been written on the strength of a last summer's trip, and I hope you will have it printed in Putnam's Monthly. But I have said nothing to his folks as to price, and will not till I hear from you again. Very probably there was some misapprehension on the part of C., I presume the price now offered you is that paid to writers generally for the monthly. As to Sartain, I know his Union magazine has broken down, but I guess he will pay you. I have seen but one of your articles printed by him, and I think the other may be reclaimed. 
Please address him at once. New York, January 2nd, 1853. Friend Thoreau, I have yours of the 29th, and credit you twenty dollars. Pay me when and in such sums as may be convenient. I am sorry you and C. cannot agree so as to have your whole manuscript printed. It will be worth nothing elsewhere after having partly appeared in Putnam's. I think it is a mistake to conceal the authorship of the several articles, making them all, so to speak, editorial. But if that is done, don't you see that the elimination of very flagrant heresies, like your defiant pantheism, becomes a necessity? If you had withdrawn your manuscript on account of the abominable misprints in the first number, your ground would have been far more tenable. However, do what you will. Yours, Horace Greeley. Thoreau did what he could, of course, and the article in Putnam came to an abrupt end. The loan made in July 1852 was paid with interest on the 9th of March 1853, as the following note shows. New York, March 16th, 1853. Dear Sir, I have yours of the ninth, enclosing Putnam's check for fifty-nine dollars, making seventy-nine dollars in all you have paid me. I am paid in full, and this letter is your receipt in full. I don't want any pay for my services, whatever they may have been. Consider me your friend who wished to serve you, however unsuccessfully. Don't break with C. or Putnam. A year later Thoreau renewed his subscription to the Weekly Tribune, but the letter miscarried, in due time came this reply to a third letter. March 6th, 1854. Dear Sir, I presume your first letter containing the two dollars was robbed by our general mail robber of New Haven, who has just been sent to the state's prison. Your second letter has probably failed to receive attention owing to a press of business, but I will make all right. You ought to have the semi-weekly, and I shall order it sent to you one year on trial." If you choose to write me a letter or so some time, very well. If not, we will be even without that. Thoreau, I want you to do something on my urgency. I want you to collect and arrange your miscellanies and send them to me. Put in Katahdin, Carlisle, A Winter Walk, Canada, etc., and I will try to find a publisher who will bring them out at his own risk, and, I hope, to your ultimate profit. If you have anything new to put with them, very well but let me have about a twelve M.O. volume whenever you can get it ready, and see if there is not something to your credit in the bank of fortune. Yours, Horace Greeley. In reply, Thoreau notified his friend of the early publication of Walden, and was thus met. March 23, 1854. Dear Thoreau, I am glad your Walden is coming out. I shall announce it at once, whether Ticknor does or not. I am in no hurry now about your miscellanies. Take your time, select your title, and prepare your articles deliberately and finally. Then, if Tickner will give you something worth having, let him have this too. If proffering it to him is to glut your market, let it come to me. But take your time. I was only thinking you were merely waiting when you might be doing something. I referred, without naming you, to your Walden experience in my lecture on self-culture, with which I have had ever so many audiences. This episode excited much interest, and I have been repeatedly asked who it is that I refer to. Yours, Horace Greeley. P.S. You must know Miss Elizabeth Hoare, whereas I hardly do. Now I have offered to edit Margaret's works, and I want of Elizabeth a letter or memorandum of personal recollections of Margaret and her ideas. Can't you ask her to write it for me? H.G. To the request of this postscript, Thoreau attended at once, but the miscellanies dwelt not in his mind, it would seem. He had now become deeply concerned about slavery, was also pursuing his studies concerning the Indians, and had little time for the collection of his published papers. A short note of April 2, 1854, closes this part of the Greeley correspondence thus. Dear Thoreau, thank you for your kindness in the matter of Margaret. Pray take no further trouble, but if anything should come in your way, calculated to help me, do not forget. Yours, Horace Greeley. In August 1855, Mr. Greeley wrote to suggest that copies of Walden should be sent to the Westminster Review, to The Reasoner, 147 Fleet Street, London, to Gerald Massey, Office of the News, Edinburgh, and to Blank, 
Wills, Esquire, Dickens's Household Words, adding, There is a small class in England who ought to know what you have written, and I feel sure your publishers would not throw away copies sent to these periodicals, especially if your week on the Concord and Merrimack should accompany them. Chapman, editor of the Westminster, expressed surprise that your book had not been sent him, and I could find very few who had read or seen it. If a new edition should be called for, try to have it better known in Europe, but have a few copies sent to those worthy of it, at all events. In March 1856, Mr. Greeley opened a new correspondence with Thoreau, asking him to become the tutor of his children and to live with him or near him at Chappaqua. The proposition was made in the most generous manner, and was for a time considered by Thoreau, who felt a sense of obligation, as well as a sincere friendship, towards the man who had believed in him, and served him so seasonably in the years of his obscurity. But it resulted in nothing further than a brief visit to Mr. Greeley in the following autumn, during which, as Thoreau used to say, Mr. Alcott and Mr. Greeley went to the opera together. End of chapter 9《not even his friend John Brown, who, like himself, suggested the Indian by the delicacy of his perceptions and his familiarity with all that goes forward or stands still in wood and field. Thoreau could find his path in the woods at night, he said, better by his feet than his eyes. He was a good swimmer, says Emerson, a good runner, skater, boatman, and would outwalk most countrymen in a day's journey, and the relation of body to mind was still finer. The length of his walk uniformly made the length of his writing. If shut up in the house, he did not write at all. In his last illness, says Channing, his habit of engrossing his thoughts in a journal which had lasted for a quarter of a century, his outdoor life of which he used to say, if he omitted that, all his living ceased, this now became so incontrovertibly a thing of the past that he said once, standing at the window, I cannot see on the outside at all. We thought ourselves great philosophers in those wet days when we used to go out and sit down by the wall sides. This was absolutely all he was ever heard to say of that outward world during his illness. Neither could a stranger in the least infer that he had ever a friend in field or wood. This outdoor life began as early as he could recollect, and his special attraction to rivers, woods, and lakes was a thing of his boyhood. He had begun to collect Indian relics before leaving college, and was a diligent student of natural history there. Whether he was naturally an observer or not, which has been denied in a kind of malicious paradox, let his life work attest. Early in 1847 he made some collections of fishes, turtles, etc., in Concord for Agassiz, then newly arrived in America, and I have in a letter of May 3, 1847, this account of their reception. I carried them immediately to Mr. Agassiz, who was highly delighted with them. Some of the species he had seen before, but never in so fresh condition. Others, as the breams and the pout, he had seen only in spirits, and the little turtle he knew only from the books. I am sure you would have felt fully repaid for your trouble if you could have seen the eager satisfaction with which he surveyed each fin and scale. He said the small mud turtle was really a very rare species, quite distinct from the snapping turtle. The breams and pouts seemed to please the professor very much. He would gladly come up to Concord to make a spearing excursion, as you suggested, but is drawn off by numerous and pressing engagements. 
on the twenty seventh of may thoreau's correspondent says mr agassiz was very much surprised and pleased at the extent of the collections you sent during his absence the little fox he has established in comfortable quarters in his back yard where he is doing well among the fishes you sent there is one probably two new species june first in other collections other new species were discovered much to agassiz's delight who never failed afterward to cultivate thoreau's society when he could but the poet avoided the man of science having no love for dissection though he recognized in agassiz the qualities that gave him so much distinction the paper on katahdin and the maine woods which horace greeley bought at a jew's bargain and sold to a publisher for seventy-five dollars was the journal of a visit made to the highest mountain of maine during thoreau's second summer at walden an aunt of his had married in bangor maine and her daughters had again married there so that the young forester of concord had kinsmen on the penobscot engaged in converting the maine forests into pine lumber at the end of august in eighteen forty six while his carlyle manuscript was passing from greeley to griswold and from griswold to graham and from graham to the philadelphia typesetters thoreau himself was on his way from boston to bangor and on the first day of september he started with his cousin from bangor to explore the upper waters of the penobscot and climb the summit of katahdin the forest region about this mountain had been explored in eighteen thirty seven by dr jackson the state geologist a brother-in-law of mr emerson but no poet before thoreau had visited these solitudes and described his experiences there james russell lowell did so a few years later and early in the century hawthorne longfellow and emerson had tested the solitude of the maine woods and written about them the verses of emerson describing his own experiences there not so well known as they should be are often thought to imply thoreau though they were written before emerson had known his younger friend whose after adventures they portray with felicity in unploughed maine he sought the lumberer's gang where from a hundred lakes young rivers sprang he trod the unplanted forest floor whereon the all-seeing sun for ages hath not shone where feeds the moose and walks the surly bear and up the tall mast runs the woodpecker he saw beneath dim aisles in odorous beds the slight linnea hang its twin-born heads and bless the monument of the man of flowers which breathes his sweet fame through the northern bowers he heard when in the grove at intervals with sudden roar the aged pine-tree falls one crash the death hymn of the perfect tree declares the close of its green century through these green tents by eldest nature dressed he roamed content alike with man and beast where darkness found him he lay glad at night there the red morning touched him with its light three moons his great heart him a hermit made so long he roved at will the boundless shade thus much is a picture of the maine forests and may have been suggested in part by the woodland life of dr jackson there while surveying the state but what follows is the brave proclamation of the poet for himself and his heroes among whom thoreau and john brown must be counted since it declares their creed and practice while in the last couplet the whole inner doctrine of transcendentalism is set forth the timid it concerns to ask their way and fear what foes in caves and swamps can stray to make no step until the event is known and ills to come as evils past bemoan not so the wise no timid watch he keeps to spy what danger on his pathway creeps go where he will the wise man is at home his hearth the earth his hall the azure dome where his clear spirit leads him there's his road by god's own light illumined and foreshowed thoreau may have heard these verses read by their author in his study before he set forth on his first journey to maine in eighteen thirty eight they were first published in the dial in october eighteen forty but are omitted for some reason in a partial edition of emerson's poems in eighteen seventy six 
he never complied with this description so far as to spend three months in the main woods even in the three campaigns which he made there in eighteen forty six in eighteen fifty three and in eighteen fifty seven for in none of these did he occupy three weeks and in all but little more than a month his account of them as now published makes a volume by itself which his friend channing edited two years after thoreau's death and which contains the fullest record of his studies of the american indian it was his purpose to develop these studies into a book concerning the indian and for this purpose he made endless readings in the jesuit fathers in books of travel and in all the available literature of the subject but the papers he had thus collected were not left in such form that they could be published and so much of his untiring diligence seems now lost almost thrown away doubtless his friends and editors upon call will one day print detached portions of these studies from entries in his journals and from his commonplace books in his explorations of concord and its vicinity as well as in those longer foot journeys which he took among the mountains and along the seashore of new england from eighteen thirty eight to eighteen sixty thoreau's habits were those of an experienced hunter though he seldom used a gun in his years of manhood upon this point he says in walden almost every new england boy among my contemporaries shouldered a fowling piece between the ages of ten and fourteen and his hunting and fishing grounds were not limited like the preserves of an english nobleman but were more boundless than even those of the savage perhaps i have owed to fishing and hunting when quite young my closest acquaintance with nature they early introduce us to and detain us in scenery with which otherwise at that age we should have little acquaintance fishermen hunters woodchoppers and others spending their lives in the fields and woods in a peculiar sense a part of nature themselves are often in a more favourable mood for observing her in the intervals of their pursuits than philosophers or poets even who approach her with expectation she is not afraid to exhibit herself to them i have actually fished from the same kind of necessity that the first fishers did i have long felt differently about fowling and sold my gun before i went to the woods i did not pity the fishes nor the worms as for fowling during the last years that i carried a gun my excuse was that i was studying ornithology and sought only new or rare birds but i am now inclined to think there is a finer way of studying ornithology than this it requires so much closer attention to the habits of the birds that if for that reason only i have been willing to omit the gun we cannot but pity the boy who has never fired a gun he is no more humane while his education has been sadly neglected emerson mentions that thoreau preferred his spy-glass to his gun to bring the bird nearer to his eye and says also of his patience in outdoor observation he knew how to sit immovable a part of the rock he rested on until the bird the reptile the fish which had retired from him should come back and resume its habits nay moved by curiosity should come to him and watch him and i have thought that emerson had thoreau in mind when he described his forester he took the colour of his vest from rabbit's coat or grouse's breast for as the wood kinds lurk and hide so walks the woodman unespied the same friend said of him it was a pleasure and a privilege to walk with him he knew the country like a fox or bird and passed through it as freely by paths of his own under his arm he carried an old music-book to press plants in his pocket his diary and pencil a spy-glass for birds microscope jack-knife and twine he wore straw hats stout shoes strong grey trousers to brave shrub oaks and smilax and to climb a tree for a hawk's or squirrel's nest he waded into the pool for the water plants and his strong legs were no insignificant part of his armour his intimacy with animals suggested what thomas fuller records of butler the apiologist that either he had told the bees things or the bees had told him snakes coiled round his leg 
the fishes swam into his hand and he took them out of the water he pulled the woodchuck out of its hole by the tail and took the foxes under his protection from the hunters he confessed that he sometimes felt like a hound or a panther and if born among indians would have been a fell hunter but restrained by his massachusetts culture he played out the game in the mild form of botany and ichthyology his power of observation seemed to indicate additional senses he saw as with microscope heard as with ear trumpet and his memory was a photographic register of all he saw and heard every fact lay in order and glory in his mind a type of the order and beauty of the whole it was this poetic and coordinating vision of the natural world which distinguished thoreau from the swarm of naturalists and raised him to the rank of a philosopher even in his tedious daily observations channing no less than emerson has observed and noted this trait giving to his friend the exact title of poet naturalist and also in his poem the wanderer bestowing on him the queer name of eidolon which he thus explains so strangely was the general current mixed with his vexed native blood in its crank wit that as a mirror shone the common world to this observing youth whom noting thence i called eidolon ever firm to mark swiftly reflected in himself the whole in an earlier poem channing had called him rudolpho and had thus portrayed his daily and nightly habits of observation i see rudolpho cross our honest fields collapsed with thought and as the staggerite at intellectual problems mastering day after day part of the world's concern nor welcome dawns nor shrinking nights him menace still adding to his list beetle and bee of what the vireo builds a pensile nest and why the pea tweet drops her giant egg in wheezing meadows odorous with sweet break who wonders that the flesh declines to grow along his sallow pits or that his life to social pleasures careless pines away in dry seclusion and unfruitful shade i must admire thy brave apprenticeship to those dry forages although the worldling laugh in his sleeve at thy compelled devotion so shalt thou learn rudolpho as thou walk'st more from the winding lanes where nature leaves her unaspiring creatures and surpass in some fine saunter her acclivity the hint here given that thoreau injured his once robust health by his habits of outdoor study and the hardships he imposed on himself had too much truth in it growing up with great strength of body and limb and having cultivated his physical advantages by a temperate youth much exercised with manual labor in which he took pleasure thoreau could not learn the lesson of moderation in those pursuits to which his nature inclined he exposed himself in his journeys and night encampments to cold and hunger and changes of weather which the strongest cannot brave with impunity mr edward hoare who travelled with him in the maine woods in eighteen fifty seven a journey of three hundred and twenty-five miles with a canoe and an indian among the headwaters of the kennebec penobscot and st john's rivers and who in eighteen fifty eight visited the white mountains with him remembers with a shiver to this day the rigor of a night spent on the bare rocks of mount washington with insufficient blankets thoreau sleeping from habit but himself lying wakeful all night and gazing at the coldest of full moons it was after such an experience as this on monadnock whither thoreau and channing went to camp out for a week in august eighteen sixty that the latter wrote with the night reserved companion cool and sparsely clad dream till the threefold hour with lowly voice steals whispering in thy frame rise valiant youth the dawn draws on apace envious of thee and polar in his gait advance thy limbs nor strive to heat the stones thoreau had much scorn for weakness like this and said of his comrade i fear that he did not improve all the night as he might have done to sleep this was his last excursion and he died within less than two years afterward the account of it which channing has given may therefore be read with interest 
he ascended such hills as monadnock by his own path would lay down his map on the summit and draw a line to the point he proposed to visit below perhaps forty miles away on the landscape and set off bravely to make the short cut the lowland people wondered to see him scaling the heights as if he had lost his way or at his jumping over their cow-yard fences asking if he had fallen from the clouds in a walk like this he always carried his umbrella and on this monadnock trip when about a mile from the station in troy new hampshire a torrent of rain came down without the umbrella his books blankets maps and provisions would all have been spoiled or the morning lost by delay on the mountain there being a thick soaking fog the first object was to camp and make tea he spent five nights in camp having built another hut to get varied views flowers birds lichens and the rocks were carefully examined all parts of the mountain were visited and as accurate a map as could be made by pocket compass was carefully sketched and drawn out in the five days spent there with notes of the striking aerial phenomena incidents of travel and natural history the fatigue the blazing sun the face getting broiled the pint cup never scoured shaving unutterable your stockings dreary having taken to peat not all the books in the world as sancho says could contain the adventures of a week in camping the wild free life the open air the new and strange sounds by night and day the odd and bewildering rocks amid which a person can be lost within a rod of camp the strange cries of visitors to the summit the great valley over to watazit with its thunderstorms and battles in the cloud the farmer's backyards in jaffrey where the family cot can be seen bleaching on the grass but no trace of the pygmy family the dry soft air all night the lack of dew in the morning the want of water a pint being a good deal these and similar things make up some part of such an excursion these excursions were common with thoreau but less so with channing who therefore notes down many things that his friend would not think worth recording except as a part of that calendar of nature which he set himself to keep and of which his journals for more than twenty years are the record from these he made up his printed volumes and there may be read the details that he registered he had gauges for the height of the river noted the temperature of springs and ponds the tints of the morning and evening sky the flowering and fruit of plants all the habits of birds and animals and every aspect of nature from the smallest to the greatest much of this is the driest detail but everywhere you come upon strokes of beauty in a single word picture or in a page of idyllic description like this of the concord heifer which might be a poem of theocritus or one of the lost bucolics of moschus one more confiding heifer the fairest of the herd did by degrees approach as if to take some morsel from our hands while our hearts leaped to our mouths with expectation and delight she by degrees drew near with her fair limbs progressive making pretence of browsing nearer and nearer till there was wafted to us the bovine fragrance cream of all the dairies that ever were or will be and then she raised her gentle muzzle toward us and snuffed an honest recognition within hand's reach i saw it was possible for his herd to inspire with love the herdsman she was as delicately featured as a hind her hide was mingled white and fawn colour on her muzzle's tip there was a white spot not bigger than a daisy and on her side turned toward me the map of asia plain to see farewell dear heifer though thou forgettest me my prayer to heaven shall be that thou mayest not forget thyself i saw her name was sumat and by the kindred spots i knew her mother more sedate and matronly with full-grown bag and on her sides was asia great and small the plains of tartary even to the pole while on her daughters was asia minor she was not disposed to wanton with the herdsman as i walked the heifer followed me and took an apple from my hand and seemed to care more for the hand than the apple so innocent a face i have rarely seen on any creature and i have looked in the face of many heifers and as she took the apple from my hand i caught the apple of her eye 
there was no sinister expression she smelled as sweet as the clethra blossom for horns though she had them they were so well disposed in the right place but neither up nor down that i do not now remember she had any or take this apostrophe to the queen of night the huntress diana which is not a translation from some greek worshipper but the sincere ascription of a new england hunter of the noblest deer my dear my dewy sister let thy rain descend on me i not only love thee but i love the best of thee that is to love thee rarely i do not love thee every day commonly i love those who are less than thee i love thee only on great days thy dewy words feed me like the manna of the morning i am as much thy sister as thy brother thou art as much my brother as my sister it is a portion of thee and a portion of me which are of kin o oh, my sister o oh, diana thy tracks are on the eastern hill thou newly didst pass that way i the hunter saw them in the morning dew my eyes are the hounds that pursued thee i hear thee thou canst speak i cannot i fear and forget to answer i am occupied with hearing i awoke and thought of thee thou wast present to my mind how camest thou there was i not present to thee likewise in such a lofty mystical strain did this concord endymion declare his passion for nature in whose green lap he slumbers now on the hillside which the goddess nightly revisits o sister of the sun draw near with softly moving step and slow for dreaming not of earthly woe thou seest endymion sleeping here End of chapter 10Chapter 11 of Henry D. Thoreau. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Kate Meehan, Austin, Texas. Henry D. Thoreau by Franklin Benjamin Sanborn. Chapter 11 Personal Traits and Social Life. The face of Thoreau, once seen, could not easily be forgotten, so strong was the mark that genius had set upon it. The portrait of him, which has been commonly engraved, though it bore some resemblance at the time it was taken, by S. W. Rouse in 1854, was never a very exact likeness. A few years later he began to wear his beard long, and this fine silken muffler for his delicate throat and lungs, was also an ornament to his grave and thoughtful face, concealing its weakest feature, a receding chin. The head engraved for this volume is from a photograph taken in 1861 at New Bedford and shows him as he was in his last years. His personal traits were not startling and commanding like those of Webster, who drew the eyes of all men wherever he appeared, but they were peculiar and dwelt long in the memory. His features were prominent, his eyes large, round, and deep-set, under bold brows, and full of fearless meditation, the color varying from blue to gray, as if with the moods of his mind. A youth who saw him for the first time said with a start, How deep and clear is the mark that thought sets upon a man's face! And indeed no man could fail to recognize in him that rare, intangible essence we call thought. His slight figure was active with it, while in his face it became contemplative, as if, like his own peasant, he were meditating some vast and sunny problem. Channing says of his appearance, In height he was about the average, in his build spare, with limbs that were rather longer than usual, or of which he made a longer use. His features were marked, the nose aquiline, or very Roman, like one of the portraits of Caesar, more like a beak, as was said, large overhanging brows above the deepest set blue eyes that could be seen, blue in certain lights and in others gray, the forehead not unusually broad or high, full of concentrated energy and purpose, the mouth with prominent lips, pursed up with meaning and thought when silent, and giving out when open 
a stream of the most varied and unusual and instructive sayings. His whole figure had an active earnestness, as if he had no moment to waste. The clenched hand betokened purpose. In walking he made a short cut, if he could, and when sitting in the shade or by the wall side, seemed merely the clearer to look forward into the next piece of activity. The intensity of his mind, like Dante's, conveyed the breathing of aloofness, his eyes bent on the ground, his long swinging gait, his hands perhaps clasped behind him or held closely at his side, the fingers made into a fist. It is not possible to describe him more exactly. In December 1854, Thoreau went to a lecture at Nantucket, and on his way spent a day or two with one of his correspondents, Daniel Ricketson of New Bedford, reaching his house on Christmas Day. His host, who then saw him for the first time, thus recorded his impressions. I had expected him at noon, but as he did not arrive I had given him up for the day. In the latter part of the afternoon I was clearing off the snow which had fallen during the day from my front steps when, looking up, I saw a man walking up the carriage road, bearing a portmanteau in one hand and an umbrella in the other. He was dressed in a long overcoat of dark color and wore a dark, soft hat. I had no suspicion it was Thoreau, and rather supposed it was a peddler of small wares. This was a common mistake to make about Thoreau. When he ran the gauntlet of Cape Cod villages, feeling as strange, he says, as if he were in a town in China, one of the old fishermen could not believe that he had not something to sell, as Bronson Alcott had when he perambulated eastern Virginia and North Carolina in 1819 through 1822, peddling silks and jewelry. Being assured that Thoreau was not peddling spectacles or books, the fisherman said at last, Well, it makes no odds what it is you carry, so long as you carry truth along with you. As Thoreau came near me, continues Ricketson, he stopped and said, You do not know me. It flashed at once on my mind that the person before me was my correspondent, whom in my imagination I had figured as stout and robust instead of the small and rather inferior-looking man before me. I concealed my disappointment, and at once replied, I presume this is Mr. Thoreau. Taking his portmanteau, I conducted him to his room, already awaiting him. My disappointment at his personal appearance passed off on hearing his conversation at the table and during the evening, and rarely through the years of my acquaintance with him did his presence conflict with his noble powers of mind, his rich conversation and broad erudition. His face was afterwards greatly improved in manly expression by the growth of his beard, which he wore in full during the later years of his life. But when I first saw him, he had just been sitting for the crayon portrait of 1854, which represents him without the beard. The ambrotype of him, which is engraved for your volume, was taken for me by Dunshe at New Bedford, August 21st, 1861, on his last visit to me at Brooklawn. His health was then failing. He had a racking cough, but his face, except a shade of sadness in the eyes, did not show it. Of this portrait, Miss Sophia Thoreau, to whom I sent it soon after her brother's death, wrote me May 26, 1862. I cannot tell you how agreeably surprised I was on opening the little box to find my own lost brother again. I could not restrain my tears. The picture is invaluable to us. I discover a slight shade about the eyes, expressive of weariness, but a stranger might not observe it. I am very glad to possess a picture of so late a date. The crayon, drawn eight years ago next summer, we consider good. It betrays the poet. Mr. Channing, Mr. Emerson, Mr. Alcott, and many other friends who have looked at the ambrotype express much satisfaction. Of Thoreau's appearance then, at the age of thirty-seven, Mr. Ricketson goes on to say, The most expressive feature of his face was his eye blue in color and full of the greatest humanity and intelligence his head was of medium size the same as that of emerson and he wore a number seven hat his arms were rather long his legs short and his hands and feet rather large his sloping shoulders were a mark of observation but when in usual health he was strong and vigorous a remarkable pedestrian tiring out nearly all his companions in his prolonged tramps through the woods and marshes 
when in pursuit of some rare plant. In Thoreau, as in Dr. Kane, Lord Nelson, and other heroic men, it was the spirit more than the temple in which it dwelt that made the man. A strange mistake has prevailed as to the supposed churlishness and cynical severity of Thoreau, which Mr. Alcott, in one of his octogenarian sonnets, has corrected, and which all who knew the man would protest against. Of his domestic character, Mr. Ricketson writes, some have accused him of being an imitator of Emerson, others as unsociable, impracticable, and ascetic. Now he was none of these. A more original man never lived, nor one more thoroughly a personification of civility. Having been an occasional guest at his house, I can assert that no man could hold a finer relationship with his family than he. Channing says the same thing more quaintly. In his own home he was one of those characters who may be called household treasures, always on the spot with skillful eye and hand, to raise the best melons, plant the orchard with the choicest trees, and act as extempore mechanic, fond of the pets, his sister's flowers or sacred tabby, kittens being his favorites, and he would play with them by the half hour. He was sometimes given to music and song, and now and then, in moments of great hilarity, would dance gaily, as he did once at Brooklawn in the presence of his host, Mr. Rickardson, and Mr. Alcott, who was also visiting there. On the same occasion he sung his unique song of Tom Bowline, which none who heard would ever forget, and finished the evening with his dance. Hearing Mr. Rickardson speak of this dance, Miss Thoreau said, I have so often witnessed the like that I can easily imagine how it was, and I remember that Henry gave me some account of it. I recollect that he said he did not scruple to tread on Mr. Alcott's toes. Mr. Ricketson's own account is this. One afternoon, when my wife was playing an air upon the piano, Highland Laddie, perhaps, Thoreau became very hilarious, sang Tom Bowline, and finally entered upon an improvised dance. Not being able to stand what appeared to me at the time, the somewhat ludicrous appearance of our Walden hermit, I retreated to my shanty a short distance from my house, while my older and more humor-loving friend Alcott remained and saw it through, much to his amusement. It left a pleasant memory which I recorded in some humble lines that afterwards appeared in my autumn sheaf. After Thoreau's return home from this visit, his new Bedford friend seems to have sent him a copy of the words and music of Tom Bowline, which is duly acknowledged and handed over to the musical people of Concord for them to play and sing. It is a fine, old, pathetic sailor song of Dibden's, which pleased Thoreau, whose imagination delighted in the sea, and perhaps reminded him of his brother John. As Thoreau sang it, the verses ran thus, here a sheer hulk lies poor Tom Bowline, the darling of our crew. No more he'll hear the tempest howling, for death has broached him too. His form was of the manliest beauty, his heart was kind and soft. Faithful below he did his duty, but now he's gone aloft. Tom never from his word departed, his virtues were so rare. His friends were many and true-hearted, his Paul was kind and fair. And then he'd sing so blithe and jolly, and many's the time and oft. But mirth is changed to melancholy, for Tom has gone aloft. Yet shall poor Tom find pleasant weather, when he who all commands shall give to call life's crew together the word to pipe all hands. Thus death who kings and tars dispatches, in vain Tom's life has doffed. For though his body's under hatches, his soul has gone aloft. Another of his songs was Moore's Canadian Boat Song, with its chorus, Row, Brothers, Row. Mrs. W. H. Forbes, who knew him in her childhood, from the age of six to that of fifteen more particularly, and who first remembers him in his hut at Walden, writes me, the time when Mr. Thoreau was our more intimate playfellow must have been in the years from 1850 to 1855. He used to come in at dusk as my brother and I sat on the rug before the dining-room fire, and, taking the great green rocking-chair, he would tell us stories. Those I remember were his own adventures as a child. He began with telling us of the different houses he had lived in, and what he could remember about each. 
The house where he was born on was on the Virginia Road near the old Bedford Road. The only thing he remembered about that house was that from its windows he saw a flock of geese walking along in a row on the other side of the road, but to show what a long memory he had when he told his mother of this, she said the only time he could have seen that sight was when he was about eight months old, for they left that house then. Soon after he lived in the old house on the Lexington Road, nearly opposite Mr. Emerson's. There he was tossed by a cow as he played near the door, in his red flannel dress, and so on, with a story for every house. He used to delight us with the adventures of a brood of fall chickens which slept at night in a tall, old-fashioned fig drum in the kitchen, and as their bed was not changed when they grew larger, they packed themselves every night, each in its own place, and grew up not shapely, but shaped to each other, and the drum, like figs. Sometimes he would play juggler tricks for us, and swallow his knife and produce it again from our ears or noses. We usually ran to bring some apples for him as soon as he came in, and often he would cut one in halves and fine points that scarcely showed on close examination. And then the joke was to ask father to break it for us and see it fall to pieces in his hands. But perhaps the evening most charming were those when he brought some ears of popcorn in his pocket and headed an expedition to the garret to hunt out the old brass warming pan in which he would put the corn and hold it out and shake it over the fire till it was heated through, and at last, as we listened, the rattling changed to popping. When this became very brisk, he would hold the pan over the rug and lift the lid, and a beautiful fountain of the white corn flew all over us. It required both strength and patience to hold out the heavy warming pan at arm's length so long, and no one else ever gave us that pleasure. I remember his singing Tom Bowline to us, and also playing on his flute, but that was earlier. In the summer he used to make willow whistles and trumpets out of the stems of squash leaves and onion leaves. When he found fine berries during his walks, he always remembered us and came to arrange a huckleberrying for us. He took charge of the hay rigging with a load of children who sat on the floor which was spread with hay, covered with a buffalo robe. He sat on the board placed across the front and drove, and led the frolic with his jokes and laughter as we jolted along, while the elders of the family accompanied us in a carry-all. Either he had great tact and skill in managing us and keeping our spirits and play within bounds, or else he had become a child in sympathy with us, for I do not remember a check or reproof from him no matter how noisy we were. He always was most kind to me and made it his especial care to establish me in the thickest places, as we used to call them. Those sunny afternoons are bright memories, and the lamb-kill flowers and sweet everlasting always recall them in his kind care. Once in a while he took us on the river in his boat, a rare pleasure then, and I remember one brilliant autumn afternoon when he took us to gather the wild grapes overhanging the river, and we brought home a load of crimson and golden boughs as well. He never took us to walk with him, but sometimes joined us for a little way if he met us in the woods on Sunday afternoons. He made those few steps memorable by showing us many wonders in so short a space, perhaps the only chinkapin oak in Concord, so hidden that no one but himself could have discovered it, or some remarkable bird or nest or flower. He took great interest in my garden of wild flowers and used to bring me seeds or roots of rare plants. In his last illness it did not occur to us that he would care to see us, but a sister told my mother that he watched us from the window as we passed and said, Why don't they come to see me? I love them as if they were my own. After that we went often, and he always made us so welcome that we liked to go. I remember our last meetings with as much pleasure as the old play days. Although so great a traveler in a small circle, being every day afield when not too ill, he was also a great stay at home. He never crossed the ocean or saw Niagara or the Mississippi until the year before his death. He lived within twenty miles of Boston, but seldom went there except to pass through it on his way to the Maine woods to Cape Cod to the house of his friend Marston Watson at Plymouth or to Daniel Ricketson's at New Bedford. To the latter he wrote in February 1855, I did not go to Boston, for, with regard to that place, I sympathize with one of my neighbors, George Minot, an old man who has not been there since the last war when he was compelled to go. No, I have a real genius for staying at home. What took him from home in the winter season was generally some engagement to lecture, of which he had many after his Walden life became little known abroad. 
From the year 1847, Thoreau may be said to have fairly entered on his career as an author and lecturer, having taken all the needful degrees and endured most of the mortifications necessary for the public profession of authorship. Up to that time he had supported himself, except while in college, chiefly by the labor of his hands. After 1847, though still devoted to manual labor occasionally, he yet worked chiefly with his head as thinker, observer, surveyor, magazine contributor, and lecturer. His friends were the first promoters of his lectures, and among his correspondents are some letters from Hawthorne inviting him to the Salem Lyceum. The first of these letters is dated Salem, October 21st, 1848, and runs thus. My dear sir, the managers of the Salem Lyceum some time ago voted that you should be requested to deliver a lecture before that institution during the approaching season. I know not whether Mr. Chaver, the late corresponding secretary, communicated the vote to you. At all events, no answer has been received, and as Mr. Chaver's successor in office, I am requested to repeat the invitation. Permit me to add my own earnest wishes that you will accept it, and also, laying aside my official dignity, to express my wife's desire and my own that you will be our guest if you do come. In case of your compliance, the manager is desired to know at what time it will best suit you to deliver the lecture. Very truly yours, Nathaniel Hawthorne, Corresponding Secretary, Salem Lyceum. P.S. I live at number 14 Mall Street, where I shall be very happy to see you. The stated fee for lectures is $20. A month later, Hawthorne, who had received an affirmative answer from Thoreau, wrote him from Boston, November 20, 1848, as follows. My dear Thoreau, I did not sooner write you because there were pre-engagements for the two or three first lectures, so that I could not arrange matters to have you come during the present month. But as it happens, the expected lectures have failed us, and we now depend on you to come the very next Wednesday. I shall announce you in the paper of tomorrow, so you must come. I regret that I could not give you longer notice. We shall expect you on Wednesday at number 14 Mall Street. Yours truly, Nathaniel Hawthorne. If it be utterly impossible for you to come, pray write me a line so that I may get it Wednesday evening, but by all means come. The secretaryship is an intolerable bore. I have traveled 30 miles this wet day on no other business. Apparently another lecture was wanted by the Salem people the same winter, for on the 19th of February, 1849, when the week on the Concord and Merrimack was in press, Hawthorne wrote again thus, The managers request that you will lecture before the Salem Lyceum on Wednesday evening after next, that is to say, on the 28th. May we depend on you? Please answer immediately, if convenient. Mr. Alcott delighted my wife and me the other evening by announcing that you had a book in press. I rejoice at it, and nothing doubt of such success as will be worth having. Should your manuscripts all be in the printer's hands, I suppose you can reclaim one of them for a single evening's use, to be returned the next morning, or perhaps that Indian lecture which you mentioned to me is in a state of forwardness. Either that or a continuation of the Walden experiment, or indeed anything else, will be acceptable. We shall expect you at 14 Mall Street. Very truly yours, Nathaniel Hawthorne. These letters were written just before Hawthorne was turned out of his office in the Salem Custom House, and while his own literary success was still in abeyance, the Scarlet Letter not being published until a year later. They show the friendly terms on which Hawthorne stood with the Concord Transcendentalists after leaving that town in 1846. He returned to it in 1852 when he bought Mr. Alcott's estate, then called Hillside, which he afterward christened Wayside, and by this name it is still known. Mr. Alcott bought this place in 1845, and from then until 1848, when he left it to reside in Boston, he expended, as Hawthorne said, a good deal of taste and some money in forming the hillside behind the house into terraces, and building arbors and summer houses of rough stems and branches and trees on a system of his own. In this work he was aided by Thoreau, who was then in the habit of performing much manual labor. In 1847, he joined Mr. Alcott in the task of cutting trees for Mr. Emerson's summer house, which the three friends were to build in the garden. Mr. Emerson, however, went with him to the woods but one day, when finding his strength and skill unequal to that of his companions, he withdrew and left the work to them. Mr. Alcott relates that Thoreau was not only a master workman with the axe, but also had such strength of arm 
that when a tree they were felling lodged in some unlucky position, he rushed at it, and by main strength carried out the trunk until it fell forward where he wanted it. It was one of the serious doctrines of the transcendentalist that each person should perform his quota of handwork, and accordingly Alcott, Channing, Hawthorne, and the rest took their turn at wood-chopping, hay-making, plowing, tree-pruning, grafting, etc. Even Emerson trimmed his own orchard, and sometimes lent a hand in hoeing corn and raking hay. To Thoreau such tasks were easy, and unlike some amateur farmers, he was quite willing to be seen at his work, whatever it might be, except the pencil-making in which there were certain secrets. And by choice he wore plain working clothes, and generally old ones. The fashion of his garments gave him no concern, and was often old or even grotesque. At one time he had a fancy for corduroy, such as Irish laborers then wore, but which occasionally appeared in the wardrobe of a gentleman. As he climbed trees, waded swamps, and was out in all weathers during these daily excursions, he naturally dressed himself for what he had to do. As may be inferred from his correspondence with Horace Greeley, Thoreau's whole income from authorship during the twenty years that he practiced that profession cannot have exceeded a few hundred dollars yearly, not half enough in most years to supply even his few wants. He would never be indebted to any person pecuniarily, and therefore he found out other ways of earning his subsistence and paying his obligations. Gardening, fence-building, whitewashing, pencil-making, land-surveying, etc., for he had a great mechanical skill and a patient, conscientious industry in whatever he undertook. When his father, who had been long living in other men's houses, undertook at last to build one of his own, Henry worked upon it and performed no small part of the manual labor. He had no false pride in such matters, was indeed rather proud of his workmanship, and averse to the gentility even of his industrious village. During his first residence at Mr. Emerson's in 1841, to 1843, Thoreau managed the garden and did other handwork for his friend, and when Mr. Emerson went to England in 1847, he returned to the house soon after leaving his Walden hut, and took charge of his friend's household affairs in his absence. In a letter to his sister Sophia, October 24, 1847, Thoreau says, I went to Boston the fifth of this month to see Mr. Emerson off to Europe. He sailed in the Washington Irving packet ship, the same in which Mr. Head went before him. Up to this trip, the first mate aboard this ship was, as I hear, one Stevens, a Concord boy, son of Stevens the carpenter, who used to live above Mr. Dennis. Mr. Emerson's stateroom was like a carpeted dark closet, about six feet square, with a large keyhole for a window. The window was about as big as a saucer, and the glass two inches thick, not to mention another skylight overhead in the deck, the size of an oblong doughnut, and about as opaque. Of course, it would be in vain to look up, if any contemplative promenader put his foot upon it. Such will be his lodgings for two or three weeks, and instead of a walk in Walden Woods, he will take a promenade on the deck, where the few trees, you know, are stripped of their bark. There is a poem of Thoreau's, of uncertain date, called The Departure, which, as I suppose, expresses his emotions at leaving, finally, in 1848, the friendly house of Emerson, where he had dwelt so long upon terms of such ideal intimacy. It was never seen by his friend, so far as I can learn, until after his death, when Sophia Thoreau gave it to me, along with other poems, for publication in the Boston Commonwealth in 1863. Since then it has been mentioned as a poem written in anticipation of death. This is not so. It was certainly written long before his illness. In this roadstead I have ridden, and this covert I have hidden. Friendly thoughts were cliffs to me, and I hid beneath their lee. This true people took the stranger, and warm-hearted housed the ranger. They received their roaming guest, and have fed him with the best. Whatsoe'er the land afforded, to the stranger's wish accorded, shook the olive, stripped the vine, and expressed the strengthening wine. And by night they did spread o'er him, what by day they spread before him, what good will which was repast was his covering at last. The stranger moored him to their pier, without anxiety or fear. By day he walked the sloping land, by night the gentle heavens he scanned. When first his bark stood inland, to the coast of that far Finland, sweet-watered brooks came tumbling to the shore, the weary mariner to restore. 
and still he stayed from day to day if he their kindness might repay but more and more the sullen waves came rolling toward the shore and still the more the stranger waited the less his argosy was freighted and still the more he stayed the less his debt was paid so he unfurled his shrouded mast to receive the fragrant blast and that same refreshing gale which had wooed him to remain again and again it was that filled his sail and drove him to the main all day the low-hung clouds dropped tears into the sea and the wind amid the shrouds sighed plaintively End of chapter 11. Recording by Kate Meehan, Austin, Texas. Chapter 12 of Henry D. Thoreau. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Henry D. Thoreau by Franklin Benjamin Sanborn Poet, Moralist, and Philosopher The character of a poet is so high and so rare in any modern civilization, and especially in our American career of nationality, that it behooves us to mark and claim all our true poets before they are classified under some other name, as philosophers, naturalists, romancers, or historians. Thus, Emerson is primarily and chiefly a poet, and only a philosopher in his second intention, and thus, also Thoreau, though a naturalist by habit and a moralist by constitution, was inwardly a poet by force of that shaping and controlling imagination, which was his strongest faculty. His mind tended naturally to the ideal side, he would have been an idealist in any circumstances, a fluent and glowing poet, had he been born among a people to whom poesy is native, like the Greeks, the Italians, the Irish. As it was, his poetic light illumined every wide prospect and every narrow cranny in which his active, patient spirit pursued its task. It was this inward illumination, as well as the star-like beam of Emerson's genius in nature, which caused Thoreau to write in his senior year at college. This curious world which we inhabit is more wonderful than it is convenient, more beautiful than it is useful. And he cherished this belief through life. In youth, too, he said, the other world is all my art. My pencils will draw no other. My jackknife will cut nothing else. I do not use it as a means. It was in this spirit that he afterwards uttered the quaint parable, which was his version of the primitive legend of the Golden Age. I long ago lost a hound, a bay horse, and a turtle dove, and am still on their trail. Many are the travelers I have spoken concerning them, describing their tracks and what calls they answered to. I have met one or two who had heard the hound and a tramp of the horse, and even seen the dove disappear behind the cloud and they seemed as anxious to recover them as if they had lost them themselves. In the same significance read his little-known verses, The Pilgrims. When I have slumbered, I have heard sounds, as of travelers passing, these my grounds. T'was a sweet music wafted them by, I could not tell if afar off or nigh. Unless I dreamed it, this was of yore, I never told it to mortal before never remembered but in my dreams what to me waking a miracle seems it seems to have been the habit of thoreau in writing verse to compose a couplet a quatrain or other short metrical expression copy it in his journal and afterward when these verses had grown to a considerable number to arrange them in the form of a single piece this gives to his poems the epigrammatic air which most of them have after he was thirty years old, he wrote scarcely any verse, and he even destroyed much that he had previously written, following in this the judgment of Mr. Emerson, rather than his own, as he told me one day during his last illness. He had read all that was best in English and in Greek poetry, but was more familiar with the English poets of Milton's time and earlier than with those more recent, except his own townsmen and companions. 
he valued milton above shakespeare and had a special love for aeschylus two of whose tragedies he translated he had read pindar semonides and the greek anthology and wrote at his best as well as the finest of the greek lyric poets even emerson who was a severe critic of his verses says his classic poem on smoke suggests simonides but is better than any poem of simonides indeed what greek would not be proud to claim this fragment as his own light-winged smoke i carry in bird melting thy pinions in thy upward flight lark without song and messenger of dawn go thou my incense upward from this hearth and ask the gods to pardon this clear flame no complete collection of thoreau's poems has ever been made amid much that is harsh and crude such a book would contain many verses sure to survive for centuries as a moralist the bent of thoreau is more clearly seen by most readers and on this side too he was early and strongly charged in a college essay of eighteen thirty seven are these sentences truth neither exaleth nor humbleth herself she is not too high for the low nor yet too low for the high she is persuasive not litigious leaving conscience to decide she never sacrificeth her dignity that she may secure for herself a favorable reception it is not characteristic of truth to use men tenderly nor is she over anxious about appearances in another essay of the same year he wrote the order of things should be reversed the seventh should be man's day of toil in which to earn his living by the sweat of his brow and the other six his sabbath of the affections and the soul in which to range this widespread garden and drink in the soft influences and sublime revelations of nature this was an anticipation of his theory of labor and leisure set forth in walden where he says for more than five years i maintained myself slowly by the labor of my hands and i found that by working about six weeks in a year i could meet all the expenses of living the whole of my winters as well as most of my summers i had free and clear for study i found that the occupation of day laborer was the most independent of any especially as it required only thirty or forty days in the year to support one this was true of thoreau because as he said his greatest skill had been to want but little in him this economy was a part of morality or even of religion the high moral impulse says channing never deserted him and he resolved early to read no book take no walk undertake no enterprise but such as he could endure to give an account of to himself how early this austerity appeared in what he wrote has been little noticed but i discovered it in his earliest college essays before he was eighteen years old thus in such paper of the year eighteen thirty four this passage occurs there appears to be something noble something exalted in giving up one's own interest for that of his fellow beings he is a true patriot who casting aside all selfish thoughts and not suffering his benevolent intentions to be polluted by thinking of the fame he is acquiring presses forward in the great work he has undertaken with unremitted zeal who is as one pursuing his way through a garden abounding with fruits of every description without turning aside or regarding the brambles which impede his progress but pressing onward with his eyes fixed upon the golden fruit before him he is worthy of all praise he is indeed true greatness in contrast with this man the young philosopher sets before us the man who wishes as the greek said planectin to get more than his square meal at the banquet of life aristocrats may say what they please liberty and equal rights are and ever will be grateful till nature herself shall change and he who is ambitious to exercise authority over his fellow beings with no view to their benefit or injury is to be regarded as actuated by peculiarly selfish motives self-gratification must be his sole object perhaps he is desirous that his name may be handed down to posterity that in after ages something more may be said of him than that he lived and died his deeds may never be forgotten but is this greatness if so may i pass through life unheeded and unknown 
what was his own ambition, a purpose in life which only the unthinking could ever confound with selfishness, was expressed by him early in a prayer which he threw into this verse. Great God, I ask thee for no meaner pelf than that I may not disappoint myself, that in my conduct I may soar as high as I can now discern with this clear eye, that my weak hand may equal my firm faith and my life practice more than my tongue saith, that my low conduct may not show, nor my relenting lines, that I thy purpose did not know, or overrated thy designs. And it may be said of him that he acted this prayer as well as uttered it. Says Channing again, In our estimate of his character, the moral qualities form the basis. For himself rigidly enjoined, if in another, he could overlook delinquency. Truth before all things, in all your thoughts, your faintest breath, the austerity purity, the utmost fulfilling of the interior law, faith in friends, and an iron and flinty pursuit of right, which nothing can tease or purchase out of us. Thus it is said that when he went to prison rather than pay his tax, which went to support slavery in South Carolina, and his friend Emerson came to the cell and said, Henry, why are you here? The reply was, why are you not here? In this act, which even his best friends at first denounced as mean and sneaking and in bad taste, this refusal to pay the trifling sum demanded of him by the Concord tax gatherer, the outlines of his political philosophy appear. They were illuminated afterwards by his trenchant utterances and denunciation of slavery and in encomium of John Brown, who attacked that monster in its most vulnerable part. It was not mere whim, but a settled theory of human nature and the institution of government which led him, in 1838, to renounce the Paris church and refuse to pay its tax, in 1846 to renounce the state and refuse to tribute to it, and in 1859 to come forward, first of all men, in public support of Brown and his Virginia campaign. This theory found frequent expression in his lectures. In 1846, he said, Any man more right than his neighbors constitutes a majority of one already. And again, I know this well, that if 1,000, if 100, if 10 men whom I could name, if 10 honest men only, a if one honest man, seizing to hold slaves, were actually to withdraw from this co-partnership and be locked up in the county jail, therefore, it would be the abolition of slavery in America. Under a government which imprisons any unjustly, the true place of a just man is also a prison. This sounded hollow, then, but when that embodiment of American justice and mercy, John Brown, lay bleeding in a Virginia prison a dozen years later, the significance of Thoreau's words began to be seen. And when a few years after our countrymen were dying by hundreds of thousands to complete what Brown, with his single life, had begun, the whole truth, as Thoreau had seen it, flashed in the eyes of the nation. In this same essay of 1846 on civil disobedience, the ultimate truth concerning government is stated in a passage which also does justice to Daniel Webster. Our logic fencer and parliamentary Hercules, as Carlyle called him in a letter to Emerson in 1839. Thoreau said, Statesmen and legislators, standing so completely within the institution of government, never distinctly and nakedly behold it. They speak of moving society, but have no resting place without it. They are wont to forget that the whole world is not governed by policy and expediency. Webster never goes behind government, and so cannot speak with authority about it. His words are wisdom to those legislators who contemplate no essential reform in the existing government, but for thinkers and those who legislate for all time, he never once glances at the subject. Yet compared with the cheap professions of most reformers, and the still cheaper wisdom and eloquence of politicians in general, his are almost the only sensible and valuable words, and we thank heaven for him. Comparatively, he is always strong, original, and above all, practical. Still, his quality is not wisdom, but prudence. Truth is always in harmony with herself, 
and is not concerned chiefly to reveal the justice that may consist with wrongdoing. For 1800 years, the New Testament has been written. Yet where is the legislator who has wisdom and practical talent enough to avail himself of the light which it sheds on the science of government? Such a legislator, proclaiming his law from the scaffold, at last appeared in John Brown. I see a book kissed here which I suppose to be the Bible, or at least the New Testament. That teaches me that whatsoever I would that men should do unto me, I should do even so to them. It teaches me further to remember them that are in bonds as bound with them. I endeavored to act upon that instruction. I say that I am yet too young to understand that God is any respecter of persons. I believe that to have interfered as I have done in behalf of his despised poor was not wrong, but right. Before these simple words of Brown, down went Webster and all his industry in behalf of the compromises of the Constitution. When Thoreau heard them and saw the matchless behavior of his noble old friend, he recognized the hour and the man. For once, he cried in the church vestry at Concord, we are lifted into the region of truth and manhood. No man in America has ever stood up so persistently and effectively for the dignity of human nature knowing himself for a man and the equal of any and all governments. The only government that I recognize, and it matters not how few are at the head of it or how small its army, is that power which establishes justice in the land. Words like these have proved immortal when spoken in the cell of Socrates, and they lose none of their vitality coming from the Concord philosopher. The weakness of Webster was in his moral principles, he could not resist temptation, could not keep out of debt, could not avoid those obligations which the admiration or the selfishness of his friends forced upon him, and which left him, in his old age, neither independence nor gratitude. Thoreau's strength was in his moral nature, and in his obstinate refusal to mortgage himself, his time, or his opinions, even to the state or the church. The haughtiness of his independence kept him from a thousand temptations that beset men of less courage and self-denial. End of chapter 12